Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 12th Annual Feminist Legal Theory Conference. We are going to start our panel momentarily on menstrual justice, law, and activism. I'm Michelle Gilman. I'm one of the co-directors of the Center on Applied Feminism here with my co-co-director, Professor Margaret Johnson. We're so excited. So many of you have chosen to spend your afternoon with us. We're just going to give folks a few, a minute or two to settle in, and then we'll be starting pretty promptly. All right, welcome again. We are ready to get started with this afternoon's events on menstrual justice, law, and activism. We have three amazing panels. You're going to hear about menstrual justice issues in carceral settings, among homeless populations, in the employment context, and in schools, among other things. And so we don't want to delay to get to the great discussion. As you'll see, we've chosen to make the conference events in meeting format rather than in a webinar format. And the reason we chose to do that is we're hoping, even in Zoom land, to build a sense of community so that we can see other folks who are here, feel free to have private chats with them to, to build bridges and engage in discussion, and feel free to post public chats. And as we move through the afternoon's events, if you have questions for our panelists, please put them in the chat and the moderators will pull out as many of them as possible to ask our panelists. So with no further ado, let's start with panel one on menstrual justice and activism across the carceral state and homelessness. And we have three speakers. You will see on our conference website detailed biographies of each speaker. So I won't spend the time lauding their many accomplishments and achievements because I know that you can look that up for yourselves. So our three speakers, and I'm pleased to serve as the moderator for this panel, are uh, Professor Margaret Johnson. She is the Associate Dean for Experiential Education here at the University of Baltimore School of Law, where she also serves as co-director of the Center on Applied Feminism. We are also delighted to have Kimberly Haven on this panel. She is the Project Director for Reproductive Inside, NARAL Pro-Choice of Maryland. And our final panelist is Claire Hunt who is joining us from across the Atlantic. Um, and she is an activist with Homeless Period Ireland. And we're so excited to hear about the accomplishments um, internationally that are happening in this space. So each of our speakers will have about 10 minutes uh, to talk to you. And then we will have Q&A at the end of all three speakers. Then we'll take a short break and move to our next panel. So welcome. And with that, I will turn it over to Margaret. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you so much for all you've done to make this conference a reality in the pandemic. Uh, it's really in incredible and welcome everyone. So there is a taboo and stigma against menstruation. We are told not to talk about it. We are shamed for menstruating in part because it's seen as dirty. We are supposed to make it invisible, but it's not invisible because it's a natural part of human life and part of the reproductive system to create human life. What I'm going to talk about in my presentation, Achieving Menstrual Justice, is an overview of my menstrual justice framework. The slide shows a process for achieving menstrual justice. First, there's menstrual taboo. And then this taboo mixes with the ever-present structural intersectionality, multiple forms of oppression based on race, gender, gender identity, and other social characterizations. And this then creates menstrual injustices, which I'll talk more about in just a little bit. I urge us to ask what I call the menstruation question to first find the menstrual injustices, then identify other related forms of oppression and find the structural intersectionality of menstrual injustice with these other forms of oppression. By doing this, I think we could work toward better achieving menstrual justice. So starting at the beginning, menstrual taboo. 
Menstrual taboo exists and promotes discrimination, oppression, harassment, and microaggressions against menstruators and menstruation, what I call menstrual injustices. Um, here. <clears throat> so I group menstrual injustices into the following categories. First, on the top left, exclusion and essentialization. This includes the lack of recognition of non-cis women as menstruators. This is seen in some policies where finally we're getting uh, some institutions to require the provision of menstrual products in bathrooms, just like toilet papers provided. But often these policies only require they be placed in women's bathrooms. Being placed there makes them inaccessible to trans men, gender queer, non-binary persons, and intersex persons who menstruate but don't use women's bathrooms. This is exclusion and essentialization of who menstruates. The second menstrual injustice category is discrimination and harassment in the top. For example, employers fire workers for bleeding and experiencing period pain. Correctional officers taunt and harass women inside for bleeding through their clothing because they are not given access to a, a new menstrual pad after a strip search. The third category is constitutional violations in the top right. And uh, Professor Marcy Karen, who will be speaking in a little bit, Professor Elizabeth Cooper and I and others argue, is this coming up? Sorry. Um, see, we have a text chain going to make sure the tech works and then my text chain is causing tech problems. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, where was I? Okay, Professor Marcy Karen, Professor Elizabeth Cooper and I, along with others, argue that the State Board of Law Examiners, administrators of the bar exam, violate the Constitution by forbidding menstruators from bringing in menstrual products or having easy access to the bathroom. Another constitutional violation is the state imposition of the tampon tax, the requirement that menstruators pay extra for menstrual products because they're not exempted from state sales tax like Rogaine or Chapstick is. The fourth category in the bottom right is insults and indignities. Schools control menstruating students' access to bathrooms, products, and menstrual education. For instance, students need to ask their teachers for permission to go to the bathroom and usually often have to say why it's urgent, thereby disclosing their menstruation. Prisons control their residents' free access to menstrual products. The fifth category in the bottom section of the slide is economic disadvantage. For instance, there's a lack of safe and clean sanitation facilities for persons experiencing homelessness. In addition, there's a lack of workplace and time flexibility for low wage workers to address menstruation's sudden flow or pain. The last um, menstrual injustice category I have is health disadvantage in the bottom left. For instance, one of the most recently talked about issues relating to menstruation is this issue of do COVID vaccines affect the menstrual cycle of menstruators? And in the New York Times um, opinion page just uh, today, or yesterday, I guess it was, a medical student at Yale said, we don't know whether it does affect the menstrual cycle. And the reason we don't know is because there's no, there's not enough health research about menstruation. We don't know enough about it. And we don't test vaccines to see how they impact menstruation. In addition, today's Earth Day, happy Earth Day. Uh, we should note that there's a lack of education, infrastructure, and access to reusable menstrual products that won't fill up our landfills or create harmful plastic waste. In addition, there's a lack of transparency about components and the toxicity of menstrual products. The panelists today are working on many of these and other forms of menstrual injustice, and I'm so excited to hear about their work. So we have menstrual injustices, but they don't happen um, without being connected to other forms of injustice. And this is where the structural intersectionality comes into play. So how do we uncover the connection of menstrual justice injustices to other forms of oppression. First, we have to ask the menstruation question to identify menstrual injustices. For example, middle school girls podcasting asked the menstruation question 
and disclosed stories of school officials perpetuating the shame and taboo about menstruation by steering students away from openly discussing menstruation. They directed students to use code language. Don't say tampon or pad, call it a marshmallow, the teacher said. They directed um, and ordered the students not to ever reveal their menstruation. It would be too upsetting to the boys. They regulated bathroom access and they failed to provide menstrual education to the girls that was medically accurate at times and also failed to give menstrual education to the boys so that they could also understand menstruation and all students could stop perpetuating the taboo. Once identifying the menstrual injustices, it's important to keep asking questions like where's the racism here? Where's the transphobia here? By doing so, we will uncover visible and less visible connections between menstrual injustices and injustices on the basis of race, gender, gender identity, class, disability. The podcasting students did just this. They drew the connection between the culture of shame in menstrual oppression and other forms of oppression, such as policing of young women of color's bodies through dress codes, the social whitewashing of desirable hair, namely that it should be straight and able to be dyed, and the policing of boys and men through gender stereotypes. In addition, asking the menstruation question can reveal that menstrual injustices are not just situated proximately next to other forms of oppression, but actually may also be intersecting, causing a different form of oppression because of a person's membership in other social categorizations. For instance, I discussed the menstrual injustice of teachers and school officials gatekeeping school-age menstruating students' access to the bathroom. By asking the menstruation question, we can see how bathroom access regulation may impact Black cisgender girls and trans boys of all races in different ways than white cisgender girls. We see the structural intersectionality because the research shows that black girls are over-policed in school and subject to greater discipline for infractions. Bathroom regulation of menstruators undoubtedly will harm them um, more severely black cisgender girls than their white counterparts and transgender boys of all races when required to reveal the need to access the bathroom due to menstruation are forced into involuntarily outing themselves if they chose otherwise not to and to do so in front of their peers that might cause a different harm than to cisgender students who make similar requests. <sighs> So after we have identified menstrual injustices and their connection to and intersection with other forms of oppression, we can then act to achieve menstrual justice by supporting, supporting the dignity, liberty, and equitable treatment of menstruators and eliminate structural intersectionality from menstrual injustice by doing some of the following things. We could stop essentializing menstruators as only cis women or products as only feminine thereby excluding all menstruators from policy and reform. We can end discrimination and harassment by enhancing anti-discrimination training to include menstruation, use our laws to challenge discriminatory practices or amend our laws if they're ineffective. We can normalize menstruation and end stigma and taboo, including by educating all students about menstruation and making it medically accurate. We can create access to affordable, safe, reusable menstrual products and sanitation facilities. We can provide work accommodation and flexibility for sudden flows and pain and menstruation in general. We can provide ample funding for and robust medical and health research. We can provide rigorous safety testing of our menstrual products. And we can create a menstrual movement intertwined with other social justice movements such as the movements for racial justice gender justice, disability justice, economic justice, health justice, and data justice. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret, for that fantastic overview. Um, I know 
when I studied women's studies in the 1980s and then feminist legal theory in law school and stayed engaged in feminist activism since that time until about five years ago, I never heard the word menstruation or period in any discussions. Um, and so this is a new um, and exciting um, field for activism with so much opportunity for change. And thank you, Margaret, for setting forth a framework that we can use to process all the different issues um, associated with menstrual justice. So at this time, I want to turn it over to Kimberly Haven. Um, Kimberly, are you here? I am. Can you hear me? I can hear you and I can see you now. Thank you. I don't know if Yay. you have a PowerPoint to share or if we'll just be uh, talking I'm going to be to doing us. a little of both. Okay. I'm going to do a little of both. Um, but I am going to share my first um, screen with everybody. Um, just to kind of give you a, as my computer decides that it wants to be on Friday mindset and not on today's mindset. There we go. Can you see my screen? Okay. Good. Yes, so we can. Thank you. Access to menstrual hygiene products in prison is not a privilege. They are a right. Unfortunately, our system doesn't believe in that. Um, menstrual hygiene and dignity for women is something that has been in the issue in, in the news for quite a while. It is considered sexy. It is considered something that we actually are looking into. And it galls me that we actually have to think legislatively about what that would um, what that's supposed to look like. Um, and so this is kind of the framework that I'm going to be talking from today um, on uh, in the uh, carceral state. If that makes sense. Okay, um, so my name is Kimberly Haven and I am the Director of Reproductive Justice Inside. And Reproductive Justice Inside is a statewide effort that works to address the needs of systems involved individuals um, to ensure their access to timely and um, quality sexual and reproductive health care and the right to parent with dignity. In everything that we do, we work to center the voices and lived experiences of those individuals to shape new narratives and drive authentically informed policy. As a way of a backstory, I do this work because of my own lived experience and the conditions and situations that I am acutely aware of. I am an advocate, I am an activist, and for a while there, I've been known as the tampon queen. Um, in 2018, we, um, we passed legislation here in Maryland that was Senate Bill 598. And what's interesting about that piece of legislation is that it was actually signed by our governor on um, April 24th, so two days. Um, and so we're coming up on the anniversary of that. And this bill and this issue is kind of why I'm here today. Um, it, this bill required that all correctional facilities in Maryland provide menstrual hygiene products freely and in quantities that someone would need. It is almost unfathomable to me that we and every state need to legislate this, and yet we do, and we did. Despite the fact that women are the fastest growing segment of our prison population, they are simply correctional afterthoughts. Our prisons, our jails, our policies are all deeply entrenched in patriarchy and outdated ideologies. Men and these systems have perpetuated this and dare I say, second class citizen sort of status. The system has quite honestly and simply set about to use a normal bodily function and the needs that we need and they have weaponized them. And what do I mean by weaponizing menstrual hygiene products? Women in um, virtually every state are given as few as three, three by five inch pads a month. And access is closely restricted. These thin pads offered no absorbency. They are often withheld um, in order to drive certain behaviors. They are used as sort of carrots to um, induce people to do something that a correctional staff officer or correctional officer wants. They are doled out in whatever quantities, in whatever time that a correctional officer wants them to do. Now women had the opportunity to purchase these products through commissary. But here too, the process became a, is a tool of systems control. You could buy them on commissary 
except you are going to pay twice the street value for these products. And that works if you had somebody putting money on your books. If you didn't have outside, and when I say books, I'm talking about your account, sorry, prison lingo. Um, if you didn't have outside support, then you could use your earnings from your institutional job. However, you also had to use that same money and remembering that you're only earning 90 cents a day, or if you were at the top of the pay chain, earning $1.35, um, you still have to pay for shampoo and soap and laundry detergent and phone cards so that you can call home. You have to pay for stationery, paper and pens that you need for school, for instance. And then COVID hit. And so now nobody was working. And so then you're stuck using these um, products that the state does give you. And so you literally had to beg or borrow. I'm not going to say steal because, well, you know, um, but you also had to literally pray that you were going to get the products that you need. And you would have to go up to an officer and ask, sort of like that, uh, was it Oliver Twist, the police, sir, can I have some more? And either they would say, I will get them in a minute or in to their defense. And anybody who knows me knows I never like to defend corrections, but they may be doing a mass movement. And so it's not their priority, but for you, it's your priority. For you, it is a necessity. They will also forget. And again, they continue to weaponize it. Now let's make it even worse, if that's even possible. And so as Margaret alluded in um, her comments, women will turn down visits. They will turn down visits with their attorneys, the very people that are supposed to be working to get them out of prison. They will call them and say, do not come. They will call their families and say, do not come. And, you know, visiting is such a special thing. Everybody looks forward to that visit. And yet when you have your period, you'll call your family and say, don't come. How do you tell your child, don't come? And the reason that they will do that is because after that visit, there is a strip search. You're not allowed to bring anything into visits. You're not even allowed to bring anything into your legal visit unless it is your legal papers and they do check. And so after this visit, when it's done, you have to do a complete strip search. You are butterball naked and you have to squat, cough, spread your butt cheeks, the whole nine yards. So now you have this, and, and for the men that are on this call, my apologies. Actually, no, no apologies. It's just what it is. There's a bloody pad. You do not want to have to put that back up against your body. To make it even worse, there is no sanitary receptacles that it can be deposited in. So now you're just throwing in a trash can, you're touching doorknobs, everybody that's coming behind you is touching the same thing. And now you have to walk back to your housing unit. And in that you have to pray that you don't bleed through your clothes because you have one laundry day. And so if it's not your laundry day, then what are you going to do if you bleed through your clothes? Because they're now cutting back on the amount of clothes that individuals can have. So if you bleed through it, you are having to wash it out in your sink, in a mop bucket, in your toilet, in the shower, which by the way, when women do that in the shower, it really grosses everybody out and it causes all kinds of stuff. But that's what women are doing. And then how do you dry it? And so now you're hanging it up in your cell in order for it to air dry and it takes forever. Um, and so all of this is um, humiliating. And this unfortunately plays out in every prison, in every jail, in every detention facility, every single day to somebody. And so how do individuals cope? In addition to trying to figure out how to manage and hustle, and seriously, that's exactly what it is. You are hustling to find someone to do your laundry for you um, so that you can get it back and they sneak it in and they do whatever they have to do. But then you make your own. And herein lies something that is probably one of the most problematic things that we've had to deal with. And so, um, when we first started doing this and why this issue was so important to me was I went into prison, I was in cancer induced menopause and I had three massive hemorrhaging incidents. And I was bleeding through four, five, six and eight pads within an hour or two. And it, um, and they kept saying that, you know, it would go, it would run, its, it would run its course. I was fine. You know, I really wasn't in menopause. I'm sorry. I know my own body as does every other person. And so when I came home, 
I ended up um, having to have an emergency hysterectomy because of toxic shock. And how did I get toxic shock? Because I took the little thin state pads that they gave us and I would rip them open and I would make my own little tampons. And while that sounds like it would work, it really doesn't. And so when we started talking about this issue and the importance of trying to make sure that women had, that individuals had access to these products in the quantity that they needed, we would do town forums and I would hold up one of these homemade tampons and I would say, particularly to the men in the audience, is this something that you would want your wife, your daughter, your sister, your mother, your neighbor to put up inside of her body? And then I would leave it on top of the, the podium that I was speaking on. And people could not not look at this, right? Um, and so at the end of it, that's what was really compelling. We did the same thing in our bill hearing and just showed what women are willing to do. And so women not only would use these pads, but then they would use whatever was at their disposal. They were using their clothes. They were tearing the lining out of the clothes. They were using their bed sheets. They were taking the filling from their beds, which let me be honest, is probably full of bugs. Um, but that's what women were trying to do. And so in the end of this, women were just trying to cope. So when we went to the legislature, and I was walking the hall with my cute little homemade tampon, and I would have legislators say to me, Kim, is this really an issue? Is this really something that we need to deal with? And the answer was yes. And we had other women tell their stories, similar stories of turning down visits, of the humiliation of having to beg, borrow uh, for the products that they needed, to pray that you didn't have bleeding incidents. And so we were able to move that legislation, as I said, almost two years, two days from to now, from now um, our governor signed that bill into law. However, and while I would love to be able to say that this solved all of our problems in Maryland, it has not because they are still weaponizing menstrual hygiene products. There's no transparency about the process despite our attempts to work with the institutions and leadership to make sure that this issue does not come back up. There's no accountability to ensure compliance. They just tell us that they can access whatever it is that they need, but they also limit the quantity and the quality of what you have. And so you still have to ask. So while they may think that 48 insert whatever here products is enough, for some women, it's not enough. And so now you're still having to beg, you're still having to borrow, you're still having to pray that you don't need these things. And while you still have the option of being able to purchase things, these things on commissary, again, unless you have outside support, your earnings have been impacted by COVID because nobody's working, no one is providing these products. And so now we have to legislate. Once again, we have to go back. We have to look at in making sure that they do comply with the, the law, that they do share how these products are accessed by individuals, that they're not just doled out, which is what happens, that it, the 48 is just an arbitrary number. Um, there is no dignity, there is no humanity, and there is no compassion in a system that makes an individual go through this. The health risks that people take to provide for themselves are incalculable. Toxic shock, infection, infertility. It is a game of Russian roulette and not a price that anyone should have to pay. Incarcerated individuals deserve no less dignity when it comes to managing a normal bodily function. So I thank you all for giving me the space to share not only my journey and the things that I saw, but why I am such a staunch advocate for this, why I am an activist for this. And I hope that you will consider joining our efforts to ensure menstrual equity for all. And while I started this by saying that for a while there, I was known as the tampon queen. Now I'm just a tampon bitch because I fight for this all of the time in multiple states. And until we have menstrual equity for all, my work is not done. And so I look forward to answering any questions that anybody has. Certainly look forward to you getting involved in the work that we're trying to do. And I thank you for inviting me this afternoon to be a part of this panel. 
Kimberly, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us and really exposing people to what's happening on the inside that remains so invisible where there's such a lack of transparency. Congratulations to you and the coalition for your legislative successes, but I know the fight is not over because you can have a law in the books, but it has to be enforced. It has to be supported. And so we all join you um, in that movement to make sure that incarcerated menstruators can retain their sense of dignity and personal health. So I'm sure you'll get plenty of questions in our Q&A time um, about your topic. And so right now I'd like to turn it over to Claire Hunt, who is joining us from Ireland. So we are not just national, we are international in scope and it's very exciting uh, for us to have you here, Claire. And I know it's much later in the evening for you than yeah. it is for us. So thank you for making the time for us and I will turn it over to you now. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, this it's uh, what time are we? It's half nine here in Dublin this evening. So, but honestly, it's an absolute honor to to be here this evening. And thank you so much to Margaret for inviting me. I feel like a bit of an imposter, but anyway, I'll tell you a little bit about my story. Um, but firstly, I think I think it's kind of important to say that you know, for all of us, I think you know the only way we can move forward with purpose and pace on this subject is when we all support each other. With our networks and our spare time and most importantly by encouraging each other and that's how homeless period ireland has grown over the last few years but sadly it's also grown because of the demand for the need for products um can you hear me there can you hear yes, you, we hear yeah, you yeah no, that's okay yeah no that's fine sorry yeah. um very clear thank you good good um, so Homeless Period Ireland is a volunteer run initiative. Um, I'm a stay at home mom, so I run it from my kitchen table. It was founded in 2016. It's not a charity, as I firmly believe that it shouldn't exist. And that's always my goal not to exist. Um, I watched the film Daniel Blake a good few years ago. Um, it's a British film and it's directed by Ken Loach and it's well worth a watch if you haven't watched it. Um, in it, there's a scene where it's set in, in the in very working class um, north of England. And in it, there's a scene where a single mum is caught shoplifting. And when she opens up her bag inside, there was a packet of pads or a box of tampons. And um, I think the story detective was, was very shocked to find this, um, as was I when I watched it, because to my shame, ever since it was something that I'd never, ever thought about before. Um, and, you know, it sent me on this kind of Google, you know, how do women who cannot afford period products manage? And I've since found out, sadly, that they use tissues, that they use cut up fabric, that they use kitchen tissue, um, which can cut the insides of their thighs. They use socks and they free bleed, not by choice, or they stay at home. If they're a young girl, they may miss out on school or they may stop taking part in sport. Once I started volunteering and met with women affected by period poverty, um, I kind of found it very, very hard to turn my back on it. And I feel sometimes that's something that's kind of easy to do. We can, you know, see something and decide not to do something about it. And I felt I had to do something about it. Um, initially, I, you know, it's, it was part of Homeless Period Dublin, but I changed the name to Homeless Period Ireland, as sadly, every county in Ireland has poverty. And also every county in Ireland has a direct provision centre, which I suppose is like an asylum seeker system. And I felt it was very important to get the message out there that this is not just an issue in Dublin, it's nationwide. And I think period poverty affects more people within our communities than we realise. It is at its most simple, a facet of financial poverty. And this is why I think we, this is where we need to ask why. And I think that we should not be celebrating the fact that in 2021 countries are beginning to provide products. I think this just really needs to happen. Sadly, there's a shame associated with periods. Um, I'm sure many of you have hidden a tampon up your sleeve or worried about leaking. And I think education is key to breaking down stigma and shame. I think boys and girls need to be thought about periods um, and from a young age. And I also believe they need to be thought throughout education. You know, it shouldn't just be a once off chat or um, it, sex education in Ireland is pretty poor. And I think, you know, when we are having these conversations about periods and provision of period products, the lack I find of, of you know, anyone speaking about an education packet package, I find very kind of disheartening because I think this actually is, is part of the problem as well, lack of education. 
Um, and I think, you know, everyone deserves to know what can and does go on within their own bodies. Periods are, are seen as something disgusting. And I did laugh a couple of years ago when uh, the male Oscar judge said he wouldn't vote for the wonderful film, um, uh, you know, uh, period and a sentence, which is on Netflix at the moment, because he said periods are icky and gross men out. And I was really, really thrilled that it won the Oscar because that attitude well and truly does need to stop. Um, I'll briefly touch on the issue of sustainability. I'm very often asked why I don't just give, you know, them as in the people who can't have access to period products menstrual cups um it's the one thing i get trolled on a lot um i think menstrual cups are a brilliant alternative but you know they're not for a, w a woman who doesn't have access to boiling water or her own bathroom or may who, who may have experienced sexual trauma or simply does not want to use one we fought a long and hard battle in ireland for choice um so i really think it is everyone's choice what products they do decide to use but i also do hope that if our government does decide to bring in legislation that they do you know look at providing um sustainable products because you know before covid uh, the other big c in the room was climate um and also i think you know again coming back to education i think we do need to to teach all of our young people what products are on the market and what maybe may be suitable for them um because sadly the equivalent of one pad i think is the equivalent of four plastic bags in the sea so i think you know wouldn't it be really great if we could tackle period poverty and you know um climate change and our single use plastic simultaneously would be wonderful. So that's kind of a little bit of the background of my organisation, but I suppose it hit the news a bit uh, this week. I think actually, yeah, it did make the, the New York Times, which was pretty unexpected, but um, I partnered up with um, Lidl, who I actually didn't realise until this week, who are in the States. Um, and they became the first major retailer in the world to combat period poverty by offering free period products in stores nationwide in partnership with myself, Homeless Period Ireland, and also with another homeless charity called the Simon Communities, which are, you know, um, they are throughout Ireland as well. So that means that Lidl have an app um, service within their stores in here. So if anyone is in the supermarket and cannot afford um, you know, because that's the other thing that I, I, I do feel very strongly about, you know, there's the obvious categories affected by period poverty, but there's also, you know, it, it's it's happening, you know, more um, commonly, I think, than people realise. And it could just be a case that, you know, someone is doing their supermarket shop and they may have X amount of money to spend. And, you know, especially with COVID and job loss and all of that, and they may decide to prioritise food, you know, or something over purchasing period products. So it just means that with this app, um, they get a coupon, they can pick up their products. They're, it, the, it's done all very, very discreetly. So the app is scanned and they get their products without having to pay for them. So I thought it was a really, really wonderful first move. Um, and hopefully other companies may start to do the same, but more importantly, hopefully our government will, will step up. Um, also, what they have done as well is partnering with um, homeless charities around Ireland to distribute products for people who may not have access to a smartphone or just may not be able to, to um, go to supermarkets for whatever reason. They've also partnered with the Ladies Gaelic Football Asso Association of Ireland um, because that's also something I think is hugely important, um, to, you know, for girls, um, let's encourage them to stay in sport rather than dropping out of sport because they've got their periods. You know, often when girls reach puberty, they kind of get embarrassed about their bodies and changes that are happening. So I think it's really, really positive for sports clubs to be involved in, in this as well. Um, so that's kind of, I know I kind of spo speak very quickly through this, but this kind of um, sums up pretty much where we are in Ireland. I do think it's it's pretty depressing that we haven't managed to secure um, free universal access to period products, but I really, really hope this year, um, you know, we will see a change because I do think particularly, you know, in COVID times, everyone has been impacted, but I think, you know, more and more certainly here, there's so many families um, impacted with job losses, so many more um, families availing of food banks and, yeah, I think hopefully we will we will get there. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Claire. It's very exciting to hear uh, what you were able to accomplish with a major retailer. So yeah. I'm eager to learn more about how the groundwork was, was <laughs> laid for that. And also, I could listen to you talk all day because your accent is so beautiful. Oh, I <laughs> so thank you for joining us. Um, all right. You. So I, I have some questions for this panel, but I welcome you all to post some questions as well. And you can put them in the chat and I'm happy to relay them to the panel. So please don't be shy. Um, the first question that I have for this panel relates to something you all touched upon, which is the stigma around menstruation. And I'm wondering if in your work, and in your activism, you have faced a stigma for trying to tackle this stigmatized issue. So maybe we'll start with Margaret and then just you know go in order to Kimberly and then to Claire. That's a great question. Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind isn't about activism, but it's about scholarship. So I've shared this before in a publication, so I'll share it again. <laughs> um, when I was first going to present for the very first time on menstruation, uh, I had a photograph, a very famous photograph um, of a performance artist who took it of her having bled through her pajamas in her bed. And it was on Instagram and Instagram had taken it down. She fought it, it got back up, went down again, and then it got back up again. And I thought that was such a great example of menstrual stigma and, you know, the, the policing, the, as you will talk about, Michelle, later, surveillance of menstruators. Um, and I wanted to show it to uh, at my presentation to colleagues. And one of my colleagues said to me, please don't show that photo. Why don't you just talk about your paper, but don't share the photo? I don't think we're ready for that. Um, and I thought about it and I thought, that's exactly why I'm doing this talk. And then I decided, you know, it, sometimes you have to meet the audience where they are. I thought I could reach the audience with my words and I didn't need a visual. Um, and so that time I chose to honor my colleague and just use my words and not a visual. Maybe next time with a visual, <laughs> baby steps, right? Uh, Kimberly, what about you? I mean, here you are, you're walking around the General Assembly in Annapolis with your homemade tampon and like really using that as a powerful illustration. I wonder what sort of pushback um, you face because of the stigma surrounding this issue, if at all, or if you feel you've been able to move past the stigma effectively. No, we haven't moved past the stigma, uh, which is why walking around holding this, you know, tired little tampon thing was so effective because it did make people uncomfortable. And that was the whole intent um, because, you know, they needed to understand, they still need to understand the steps that women are having, that individuals are having to go through to provide the products that they need. And so, you know, I would sometimes apologize. I would say, sorry, this is going to get squishy. And then I stopped doing that because it's bad enough that, you know, when we have to go to a correctional officer and say, please, sir, can I have some more? Um, not everyone is comfortable with that, um, particularly um, individuals who have grown up where bodily, normal bodily functions weren't discussed as part of growing up, and then they, or they've been traumatized in some way, and then they come into a system that is weaponizing a normal bodily function. And, and that just furthers that sense of stigmatization, that sense of shame. And so I quite frankly don't care if I make people uncomfortable in this space and with this conversation anymore. I should, I don't. You shouldn't. I think that's just the right attitude. We have to work to destigmatize this entire topic. The reason we have period poverty and discrimination and all the forms of oppression Margaret talked about is partly because we've been scared to talk about it and confront it. Not those of us here today, we're working towards that, but this is a very nascent early stage movement for sure. Claire, what about you in Ireland? How have you dealt with pushing past the stigma and have you gotten pushback in your advocacy? Yeah, I've definitely got pushback. It's been a really kind of strange place. Um, that's why I just find like a, an event like this, to see, you know, this evening, it's wonderful because it, it was such a silent space for so long. Um, I think kind of what happened here was um, the more people I met with affected by period poverty, the more frustrated I got and the more noise I wanted to make about it. So in my own head, our I'm not even going to explain or compare political structures, but kind of, I suppose, <clears throat> 
we would have county councils and then we have our main government. So in my own head, I was like, okay, I'm gonna get this to county council level. Maybe it's like a borough or something, you know, I don't know. But so I was like, okay, I'm gonna to speak to people. And then initially when you start speaking about periods, everyone's like, oh no, and I'll listen to you, no one will want to know. But then um, it's like kind of what Kimberly said, then people start to see period talking about periods as something sexy and something cool and I kind of feel sometimes you can go okay god this is really annoying but you can also use that to your advantage right because people do like to get a, a, attention by speaking about these things so I think once I kind of had it pushed to county council level um then more government ministers got um interested and sorry that was something I should have said earlier when I spoke in 2019 um, for the first time in the Irish Parliament, an all-female cross-party got behind the initiative and um, a motion passed in our Parliament in favour of period poverty. Um, and this was monumental and this was, you know, the first time this had happened in our Parliament and everyone was talking about periods, everyone was saying periods, everyone was saying period poverty. So I thought this was fantastic and this was the job done but then it went silent. Um, so I think what I find frustrating about period poverty is yes, you will, are talking about periods, not even period poverty. I think what you will find is it kind of goes in swings and roundabouts, like it'll have a moment and then it'll drop off and then it will come back again. So I think kind of the hard part here is just, just to keep it to the fore and, and to keep people talking and just keep pushing it. Um, but no, I mean, listen, you'll always get people who will be a bit like, oh, you know, don't know, don't want to go there. But I think you just have to, it's perseverance. Yeah, perseverance is definitely, yeah. you know, part of any strategy for social justice. Yeah. Um, I'm just checking the chat here, and I want to thank the members of the University of Baltimore Law Review, who are co-sponsoring today and tomorrow's event with us, and they've been providing all sorts of very helpful links and connections in the chat that you should take a look at. Um, and so we want to thank them for that. Um, Odina, I see that you have your hand up. Do you have a question for our panelists? Well, I, I have, sorry, I had it off. Um, just a couple of quick comments and then a question. Um, first of all, Ms. Haven, when you said that you were a tampon bitch, I remember my sister saying, bitch, those letters mean simply babe in total control of herself. So wear that flag proudly. Um, I also wanted to say that I am so, I got my first period when I was 11 years old. Um, and the amount of shame that I had around that, not only then, but for many, many years, I'm just really energized by the fact that we're normalizing periods because for many of us that are a little older, it was so shameful for so long, even though now I am eternally grateful that I don't have one anymore. That wish started happening when I was about 12. Um, but I did want to also point out that there are intersectional issues here as there are with so many things. Um, and that has to do with black women and fibroids. Every single Black woman that I've ever asked, do you have fibroids, has said yes. Um, it is an epidemic in this country, and one of the side effects of fibroids is that you bleed a lot. I had fibroids and at one point was bleeding so badly that I literally fainted because of the amount of bleeding that I was doing and I was so anemic. So I do think that it's important to, to realize that what is a, quote, normal period may be raced because of the tremendous number of black women and perhaps other women of color. I don't know, but I do know black women have a lot of fibroids. So even here, there is an, an intersectional issue that I think needs to be discussed as well. That's it. Thank you, Odina, for sharing that. That really relates to Margaret's point earlier today that we need to ask the menstruation question, which is a way of unpacking how different intersectional identities relate to these issues of both oppression and then to solutions for justice 
to reform these oppressive effects. So really want to thank you for sharing that. There's a wonderful question in the chat from Professor Abrams that I'm going to hold till we have a panel on education later today. I think it would be a perfect fit um, for that panel, panel three. Right now, we're going to take a five minute break so that our speakers for panel two can get themselves organized. And so that our wonderful audience members, if you need a break or need a drink, please take five minutes and we will see you back here at 455 for the second panel. Thank you. Thank you to all our panelists. Okay, let's get started. I'd like the second panel, the presenters for the second panel to please come back and our wonderful audience, please come back. I am filling the role of moderator um, because our lovely Professor Michelle Gilman will be actually on this panel. So let me make sure that I see Professor Karen uh, and Professor Summer, perfect. So this is our second panel, Menstrual Justice, Research and Activism Across Employment, Homelessness, and Data Privacy. We have three presenters. First is Professor Marcy Karen. She's the Jack and Olander Professor of Law and Director of the Legislation Clinic at the David A. Clark School of Law, University of the District of Columbia. Go Firebirds. And her paper is or her presentation is Menstruation at Work. Professor Marnie Summer is joining us from Columbia University, New York. Uh, she is an associate professor of sociomedical sciences at the Mailman School of Public Health, Columbia University. And her presentation is Menstruation and Homelessness. And our final speaker on this panel is Professor Michelle Gilman. She is the Vener Venable Professor of Law and co-director of the Center on Applied Feminism at the University of Baltimore School of Law. And her presentation is Menstrual Apps and Privacy. Um, and so Professor Karen, why don't you start us off? Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna quickly share my screen. And I also am gonna um, take a, a point of personal privilege um, to thank Dean Johnson and Professor Gilman, I was thrilled when they announced that they were bringing this conference back after a short hiatus. And then, um, you know, COVID played a big joke on all of us. And haha, it's not funny. Um, and now here we all are. Um, so I just really want to thank you for continuously bringing space to talk about these issues, and in particular for um, uh, not deciding to drop this off when, when you had the opportunity to for, for bringing it back when we went virtual. Um, I also want to just um, in particular thank Margaret because I've learned so much and have found it to be such a joy to collaborate with her on a range of scholarship and advocacy in these spaces. Um, truthfully, I'm a better advocate and a better scholar for having worked with Margaret on these spaces from her guidance, from her, um, we'll just call it gentle nudging, <laughs> um, including the encouragement to put the finishing touches on um, the paper that I'm going to talk about today, which marries my expertise in employment justice and some work my students and I engaged in as part of the legislation and civil rights clinic I direct. She's been hearing me talk about this for about five years now, so thank you. Um, here we go, menstruation at work. Um, and and my goal for today is to do three things. First, to provide a quick overview of why menstruation matters at work. Second is to explain how current law offers promise but fails to comprehensively address menstrual needs at work. And then third is to put out a proposal to address the reality. Um, and so first, why does menstruation matter at work? And it relates to a truth that Margaret mentioned and um, that most of you know, right? Periods don't stop when you are a menstruator and you are at work. And if you were to track consecutively how long the average menstruator would be on their period at work, it would be over six years over the course of their lifetime. So that's a large chunk of time, right? For which people need to figure out how to address a biological process. And many workers have no problems doing so, right? They have access to work by structures that allow regular, safe and adequate application and disposal of menstrual products and the education and income needed to afford those products. And they work at places and with people who do not stigmatize or harass or prevent opportunities because of menstruation. But that is not as common as I once thought it was. And there is growing recognition that this is not everyone's reality. The structural mismatch prevents people from properly addressing periods at work. 
And some people can't afford products, others don't have access to um, flexible scheduling or time off or accommodations or the ability to take paid break time as needed, which causes some workers to either stay in their clothes, face ridicule, or leave work. Right? Um, and it's exacerbated when a period arrives unexpectedly if you're a young worker, or if it arrives differently than it has in the past, or over one's lifetime as people sort of enter perimenopause onto menopause. And it's a problem if workers aren't able to to secure either products or time and space to address menstruation. And it's a pro problem if they can't do that without fear of repercussion or retaliation. But the reality is, right, that workers are regularly put in this catch-22 where they have to choose either to miss work, be late for work and fear discipline or risk their health, whether that's with makeshift products, whether that's with um, leaving products in longer than anticipated or, or advised or something else. Um, and menstruation has caused some people to be disciplined. It has caused many to be harassed. It has caused others to be fired from work related to their periods. So I could tell you the story of a premenopausal worker who had a period with unpredictable and inconsistent blood flow, who bled through her clothes at work after her period arrived unexpectedly. And the response to that unexpected bleeding was you ruined and damaged company property with a blood stain, you're fired. And so we heard in the first panel, right, periods and blood are stigmatized, they're gendered, they're subject to religious, social, other assumptions. And sometimes that means that that corresponding shame and lack of awareness surrounding menstruation will make its way into the workplace and subject people to discrimination and harassment. Adverse actions are taken because of menstruation, whether it is harassment or termination. There are stories of people being subjected to menstruation related jokes, right? Comments about PMS or the gift, which I personally don't want, but no one will take back, right? Those happen at work all the time. And I can joke about it because I sit here as a privileged law professor with control over my schedule and my body in ways that most workers, especially low wage workers and workers of color do not have. So I could tell you, right, about another worker who was barred from sort of work post maternity leave until her cycle was normal again. Um, and thank you to the UB colleague who mentioned how people's normal cycle isn't really a thing, um, or a different employer who fired a, um, a, a worker with a disorder related to menstruation after she disclosed it to her supervisor. And the supervisor thought that um, she, it would impact her work unnecessarily. And so, you know, despite efforts to remove it, there remains shame and lack of awareness surrounding menstruation and blood, and it makes people uh, or causes people to be um, uh, discriminated against work. And if you think about the power dynamics of having to ask a non-menstruating supervisor for a break, right, that you can see immediately why this can be even more problematic, or if you don't have extra clothes, or if you don't have the ability to go get products or clothes, not to mention the further complications for transgender and gender non-conforming uh, people who menstruate. Of course, historically, some workplaces even um, segregated uh, or prohibited women from working while they were on their periods, right? Doctors had to point out that menstruation didn't prevent someone from performing their duty when women pilots were prevented from flying during World War II when they were on their periods. Thankfully, there's less overt discrimination like that these days, but um, people are still forced to choose between their health and their dignity and economic security related to menstruation. So in four minutes or less, I'm going to explain this super complicated slide um, and take a step back. Um, I never leave myself enough time. Um, so what is on this slide, right, are three buckets of needs related to menstruation at work and corresponding existing legal protections that sort of, but not really offer some, but not all um, uh, menstruators, some type of protection at work. Um, and so, you know, the first big bucket is menstrual accommodations structurally. This is probably the most common need, right? This includes things like access to break time and bathrooms. You know, if the, the recommendation is you change your tampon or pad or, or other product every four to eight hours, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on, you know, the menstruator's body and the product used. If you don't have a structure that lets you take a break or go to a bathroom, that is a problem. So there, there are some laws that offer some protections, but in the US, there's no law that requires paid menstrual leave or break time for someone to manage menstruation. The major law governing work hours on the federal level is the Fair Labor Standards Act. Generally, it doesn't require time or space accommodations. Um, in 2010, it was amended by the Affordable Care Act to create provisions related to expressing milk, which is the first time there were time and space accommodations required. Um, but that hasn't yet been extended, although there's a, um, a, a 
clear correlation and analogy that can be made from lactation and um, to menstruation. But right now there's no requirements. Um, it's not explicitly covered under the Family Medical Leave Act. Um, uh, and from the policy perspective, I don't necessarily want to say menstruation is a serious health condition so that people could be covered by the FMLA. There are requirements related to time and space accommodations if menstruation is a disability. And there are some conditions related to bleeding like endometriosis endometriosis or fibroids um, uh, that might be covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act. But again, the normal period, right, shouldn't be covered. I think that there's some creative lawyering that could happen to offer discrimination protection if someone's regarded as having a disability related to assumptions based on blood or assumptions based on periods and what people can or can't do and whether or not their lives and daily activities are limited. But you don't get accommodations if you are um, bringing a claim under the regarded as disability um, uh, claim. And so it doesn't necessarily give you what you want. Um, uh, there are uh, some state and local laws, right, that are offering small necessities leaves. Um, the terming and framing of small necessities is, is problematic for all sorts of reasons, but there might be some local protections, but they don't offer explicit menstrual leave like is offered in some other countries. Um, and as a result, there's poor attendance, decreased productivity, exacerbated medical conditions, and a variety of other things. Second big bucket is the ability to safely address menstruation, right? That could be things like having access to products or menstrual friendly bathrooms. Um, if you don't have access to a toilet or water or waste receptacles, you cannot safely address your period. And so um, there is a law that requires employers to provide safe workplaces. That's the Occupational Safety and Health Act. In 1992, they issued an interpretation letter that says generally, right, dis um, discarded feminine hygiene products and, and other materials that absorb menstrual flow aren't covered. It's up to the employer to figure it out. And so good luck with that. Um, and so, right, um, people uh, get a stain at work. They're, they're uh, stain their clothes. They face ridicule and a variety of other things. The IRC that I have on there is the Internal Revenue Code. I think there's some space for tax incentives to offer um, for employers to provide this voluntarily, which they're not all doing right now. Um, and then the last big bucket, because I'm out of time, is to be free from menstrual discrimination, right? Um, and that is um, uh, currently Title VII of the Civil Rights Act says that employers can't take an adverse employment action at work because of sex. There is a strong argument that menstrual discrimination is sex discrimination under Title VII, full stop. Um, uh, in addition, in 1972, when the Pregnancy Discrimination Act amended the law um, and defined because of sex to include because or on the basis of pregnancy or related medical condition, that there is a hook there. Some courts have interpreted menstruation as a related uh, medical conditions, others haven't. And that brings me to my proposal, which is to address all of these buckets and to look on SSRN in about four months for my um, paper that will actually address all of this stuff. And I just want to end where I started, which is thank you all for, for giving us the, the time and space, ironically, to talk about menstruation, including at work. And I look forward to talking more in um, the Q&A. Thank you so much, Marcy, for that presentation. Um, as you said, I'm eagerly awaiting this paper. I know it's going to be so thorough and so helpful to employees who are suffering through uh, the type of discrimination, harassment, surveillance in the workplace, um, to the fact that we have a patchwork of court decisions, some favorable, some not. Um, you know, Alicia Coleman, the woman you talk about, she was unsuccessful in the lower court and the appellate court um, settled. So I look forward to your work. I know it's going to make a big difference uh, to employees and to employers. So thank you so much for that presentation. The next person is Professor Marnie Summer. Hello, thank you. It's a little daunting to follow all these amazing people. Um, so I'm just going to dive right in. I'm going to use more slides than other people because um, it's just what we do in public health. Um, but uh, thank you so much for inviting me, for having this extraordinary event. Um, it's just, I, I don't even know what to say to have all these legal minds and activists thinking about these issues. It's just um, just really fantastic. So um, just because I want to make sure I don't go over my 10 minutes. 
Um, what I just want to talk about is a small study that we did uh, pre-COVID, although COVID now is sort of very front and center in terms of how this might have played out if we did this this summer or even last summer, um, looking at the issue of menstruation for those experiencing homelessness in New York City. So just full disclosure, I'm actually in Baltimore right now, so waving at you all from Mount Washington, uh, where I am for a few days just visiting family. Um, so just in terms of what are we talking about, so in the world that I am mostly in, which is sort of this global menstrual space where people have been trying to particularly address the issues of girls in schools or those in humanitarian contexts, um, generally we're thinking about this bucket of things that are on this screen, which is a very pragmatic um, approach to what you need to manage, although I had to smile at Marcy's workplace thing because it took me two years to get my school public health to put little dispenser units in the stalls in our bathrooms, and I'd been working on periods for a decade at that point. But anyway, um, but I didn't want to forget the issue of menstrual stigma because it kind of either is the umbrella or the underpinning of really everything we're talking about to a large extent, um, which is not to uh, discount all the other aspects of menstruation that are quite relevant, but this is sort of what we were focusing on and what I'm talking about today. So um, this is a slide I showed that some of you have seen that I borrowed from a wonderful colleague and mentor of mine, Kim Hopper, who's been working in homelessness for 30 plus years and helped to found the Coalition for the Homeless in New York, who was our partner on the study we did. This was a slide from 2019. So just, I'm just making it really obvious pre-COVID. Um, how many, you know, New York has this right to shelter, which probably you all know the law and, and those issues better than I do. Um, so we actually, in comparison to where my team member is in LA, we have a lot more people in shelters, in fact, than, than you know, our West Coast colleagues. Um, and then the number that's on the streets. As somebody who has basically not left New York during the pandemic, I can tell you there's a lot more people on the streets now than before. They're scared to be in the shelters, understandably. Um, so th this is not accurate per COVID, but this is what it was uh, before. So what we tried to do, this was a tiny study, it was really a no budget study, we just felt very strongly that we wanted to look at this issue because there was so little data around what is the lived experience if you have your period and um, while you are either living on the street or in shelters, um, particularly for prolonged periods of time. Um, and so we went out there and this is just kind of the aim was to really understand what is that experience, both in relation to um, access to toilets, whether it's in shelters or commercial spaces or public toilets or whatever it is, and also the issues around products. Obviously, this would all be better resolved if people had access to stable housing, which they don't. Um, so this was sort of what, what should we, can we be doing in the absence of that more stable housing being provided? So what did we do? We, we hired a bunch of students and, uh, and then myself and my team did a lot of interviews. We interviewed folks at homeless service organizations, government agencies, the, the mayoral administration didn't really want to talk to us, but we found our way to other people. Um, we did in-depth interviews with both those living in shelters or who had been living on the street. And this did include, we didn't, it was um, a primarily cisgender population because the um, there is a large sort of trans youth population who are homeless, but rightfully the shelters where they are were very protective of them. And um, so we didn't actually do interviews in this study, we did do in a separate study. Um, and then we did public toilet audits. I roped in a colleague at the CUNY School of Public Health who's a spatial analysis guy. I'm not really gonna talk about that today, but we mapped sort of the, sort of the quality, accessibility, hours, maintenance, menstrual friendliness of toilets, um, public toilets in hotspot areas where there were clusters of homeless populations who, according to the data, were more likely to be those who are menstruating. So just I'm going to whip through this really quickly because um, we have lots more great things to hear today and I'm just focusing on the issue of privacy or trying to note it a little for the underlying theme of, of this event today. Um, so very quickly, because I always like just to have quotes in there so you can hear exactly what was said to us. Um, for those who are, um, this was particularly things that we found in terms of those who are sheltered population. So not surprisingly to anybody on here, uncertain access to save clean private spaces for changing products. Um, 
particularly those living in single shelters. I learned a lot more about the shelter system in New York, which I won't get into today. Um, family shelters tended to have apartments, um, but for those in these single shelters, single people where you're sharing bathrooms or sharing apartments, it got to be, it was clearly very problematic. Um, you can read these quotes. They do not sound like appealing bathrooms, frankly, for anything, let alone for managing your period where you have to be in there for a prolonged period of time. Similarly, sort of this, again, I'm sure this won't come as a surprise to any of you, but inadequate stock of necessities. Um, you know, if you don't have products, you might need toilet paper, but to wrap your products, if there's no way to throw them, a lack of trash cans, disposal units, which Marcy just spoke to, um, shelter policies in New York, and I think many places limit access during the day for not necessarily, they need to clean, they have some justifiable reasons, but um, there may not be a lack of alternative toilet options. Um, and then I just wanted to flag for COVID, there were already issues. A lot of people were going to Burger King's, McDonald's, Starbucks until Starbucks sort of started to take away their bathrooms in New York City. Um, but obviously everything shut down, libraries, toilets, commercial spaces during COVID. So that has been just a huge issue in the city, uh, not just for those who are homeless. And then for those on the street, not surprisingly, it was very clear to us that they are struggling the most. Our partner on the study was the Coalition for the Homeless, and they had predicted this. And again, none of us were um, surprised to hear it. Um, but sort of just again, uh, this was all sort of quotes that came out of references to public toilets in the city, um, not being clean, not being wiped down the subway. I mean, I didn't even frankly know there were toilets in the subway system. That's how like rare and awful they are. Um, and uh, my favorite quote from most people we interviewed who spoke to it was like, I'm not a germaphobe. Why on earth would I go into the subway bathrooms? Um, so I think there's all sorts of perceptions about this population that are obviously um, incorrect. B, I'm just whipping through, but bathing and laundering difficulties, sort of how do you keep clean? Again, I'm not gonna repeat what um, we already heard from over the pond in Ireland and also um, about the workplace, um, but, but significant challenges to keep clean, to launder and what that does to your sense of self and your confidence and your ability to seek out work and education and services is really tremendous. And a shortage of locations for showering, particularly for those in the street. Um, places where you could go and shower um, so you could go about your day and feel good. And then, of course, the overarching issue of menstrual stigma, what it does to your confidence, your ability to engage. And this, again, came out of the prior presentations. Um, and just again, I like to have the quotes directly from people about what that does to you and how that impacts your ability to sort of go out and take care of life, whether it's the smell or a stain. Um, and sort of how that intersects with this longstanding societal stigma around menstruation. And then this issue of passing, um, which I learned about back when I was a doctoral student, actually Kim Hopper, who was my co-investigator, was my mentor when I was a student at Columbia. Um, and just this notion of how the, those experiencing homelessness are try always trying to pass in society so they can get into um, a museum or a library with a bathroom so they can go shopping, so they can do whatever they need to do. Um, and sort of the implications of not being able to pass if you can't keep clean. And then just sort of re-emphasizing that issue, the way in which embarrassment and shame, particularly when you have your period, um, sort of just sort of how people tried to organize their days, getting on a train to get to the place where they might be able to bathe in time so they could then go wherever they needed to go and sort of that anxiety around leaking onto your clothes and then how you'd have to throw that away because they didn't have a source of clothes. Um, what I'm not talking about a lot today is the issue of access to menstrual products. I just wanted to have one slide. We have a lot more to say about this, um, but, but because I wanted to stick to the privacy angles um, in a lot of shelters or service organizations, along with not even knowing they may have products and oftentimes they may not have, um, this issue of kind of these gatekeepers um, who has them, who has the key, who doles them out, similar to what we heard from Kimberly around um, quality and numbers you get, like getting one at a time for anybody who menstruates, that's just insane. Um, and sort of the humiliation of, of having to go back, which is not to say this is everybody's experience. We certainly heard some good stories too, um, but I wouldn't say that was the dominant story we heard or narrative. And then I just wanted to show you one quick slide. This We had these wonderful students who walked literally like 100 miles this summer in 90 degree weather that summer. Um, and how sort of from, this was obviously again pre-COVID, from Penn Station to libraries. That library didn't have an out of order restroom. They just didn't want people coming in and using it because the students would go in and check um, to sort of 
my, the student showed like the door on this park bathroom was like above her waist, like the toilet, you could see the toilet, the stall door was like zero privacy. So just, they really did a fantastic job um, doing this sort of auditing. We had a checklist that they used with every bathroom. So I just wanted to, for those who wanted to hear more than this 10 minute sort of rapid fire, um, we have one paper out that's all about sort of the access to toilets and bathrooms and bathing and laundering spaces. We had one that literally just got published last week um, around the access to menstrual products and supply issues. Um, we have the toilet audit one is still under review. That one's taking forever, but it will, I hope, be out eventually. And then for many of you, we all were sort of part of this symposium and there will be a paper where we just focused in on the issue of toilet policy in New York and the US um, and then linked it back to the issue of menstruation. Um, so that's just my thanks to my co-investigators and, and those who supported this study. I have no idea if I stuck to 10 minutes. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you were right on time. Okay. Marty. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for that incredible presentation and Thank you for your work. I know you, you know, you were like, I'm going to a law conference, <laughs> but I'm a public health person, but we need and rely on the excellent research and the spotting of issues and the uncovering and the collection of stories so that we can hopefully figure out are there legal solutions or do we need to create some laws to help address this? So your work has, you know, you've been doing it for over a decade, it's incredible, the body of your work, and we are so grateful that you're here sharing your work with us. So thank you so much, really appreciate it. All right, um, the next presenter is Michelle Gilman presenting her uh, menstrual apps and privacy talk. So Margaret, before I let you go, can you see my slides adequately? I can absolutely see them adequately. Thank you so much. <laughs> Just want to make sure. All right. Thank you, Margaret. I'll be talking today about periods for profit and the rise of menstrual surveillance. So for all you menstruators out there, your periods are quite profitable just not for you. <laughs> they have been seized on as a profit opportunity by venture capital firms who are backing a wide array of femtech products. Femtech is a broad name for all sorts of hardware, software, digitally enabled devices that are aimed at assisting women in managing their physical, reproductive, and mental health. This is expected to be a $50 billion industry by the year 2025. And this slide shows you some of the companies engaged in this space. This afternoon, I will give you a flavor of the femtech market identify the ways that menstrual surveillance has oppressive effects on menstruators, explain why law is failing to protect menstruators, and then suggest a menstrual justice approach to reforming this industry. So let's start by taking a look at some femtech tools. To begin with, there are over 1,000 period trackers and fertility apps in the iPhone app store, including Clue, which is depicted on this slide, which promises to help women monitor their periods and fertility. And also, as you can see on this slide, to track cramp, skin, hair, sleep, and more, quote, to gain a better understanding of how your body works. And this sort of rhetoric of empowerment through self-knowledge is very, very common in the femtech space, but I argue that the rhetoric and the reality are not the same. Smart tampons have also gotten a bit of attention. One of them uses technology to analyze menstrual blood in order to predict various health conditions. And the other one depicted here has a long tail that is connected to a wearable that is Bluetooth connected to your smartphone to tell you when your tampon is full and should be changed. This company sells a wearable device that you can see on the model's hand here that will quote, identify both the opening and closing of the fertile window. There are also wearable devices for pregnant women that you can see here designed to monitor maternal and fetal health. 
This fertility system will use a vaginal sensor, quote, to identify your peak fertile days, unquote. This is an app that connects to a mother's breast pump in order to monitor milk volume in real time. This is an app designed for menopausal women, a new growth market in this space. Uh, you provide the data and the app will, quote, create a journey tailored for you with challenges, tips, and reminders. And related to the workplace, as Marcy was discussing, this product called Ovia is available to employers. And there are employers with over 10 million workers across the country who use this um, product for workplace wellness. And they offer the app to their employees and they heavily incentivize employees to download and use the app, which covers pregnancy, fertility, and parenting, uh, and incentives can be in the form of cash bonuses, gift cards, and things like that. So I am viewing these femtech tools, and believe me, that is just a sampling because <laughs> there are thousands, uh, but I'm viewing these through the frame of menstrual oppression. And in an article I have forthcoming in the Columbia Journal of Law and Gender of Gender and Law, I highlight six different forms of oppression. But today I am going to focus on two of them. And the first concern that I have relates to the loss of privacy in using these products. So how do these companies make money? Most period trackers do not charge users when they download the app. Instead, they make money by selling users data to advertisers. So in using a period tracker, menstruators are incentivized to enter reams of personal data into the app, not just demographic data, but also mood, sexual positions and practices, the quality of cervical mucus, and much more. And on this slide, you can see an app requesting permission to access a variety of health information. And the apps are also collecting data that the user doesn't enter, such as their GPS coordinates, their IP address, which is the unique identifying number on your device that tracks you across the internet. Um, these apps also can scrape a list of the other apps that you are using on your phone and so forth. And so this means that the data is not just being used by the app, but also being shared as part of the big data economy, primarily to fuel the targeted advertising industry. So these companies share users' personal data with big tech companies like Facebook and Google that I'm sure you've all heard of, but as well, as an entire industry of data brokers. And these are companies that scrape data about you from a variety of sources, as shown on this slide, in order to build a digital profile of you that gets sold to multiple industries, including marketers. And companies love this data. In fact, a pregnant woman's data is worth 15 times that of the average person. Hmm, why is that? Because companies want to generate brand loyalty at the start of a major life change. So Consumer Reports did an analysis of uh, five leading period trackers and fertility apps. And as their analysis shows, the privacy policies that come with these apps can be quite confusing. Some apps require users to share their name and address as a condition of accessing the tool. All of the apps studied shared user data with advertisers and marketers, some with health researchers, and some with employers and insurers. And very few of them use basic security precautions to keep users' data secure. And the lack of meaningful consent to this data sharing violates the values of autonomy and dignity that underlie norms of personal privacy. So the second form of oppression associated with these tools that I wanna to discuss is the way that they force users into a gender binary. So this is a screenshot of the iPhone app store when you search for a period tracker. Hmm, what colors are dominant on this screen, right? It looks like the girls section of a toy store exploded. 
flowers are very popular in this space. And to be fair, studies show that some women, women respond very favorably to this girly, very feminine framing, but many others resent it. In one study, a user stated, it just felt condescending or like they were designed by dudes who were designing what they thought a woman would like. Developers assume that users identify as female, that they have male partners, and that they are using the app for the purpose of tracking ovulation. And these assumptions can flatten users' experiences. As Maggie Delano, an engineering professor, wrote about her experience with a period tracking app, she reflected that the app's design tells, quote, queer, unpartnered, infertile, and or women uninterested in procreating that they aren't even women, unquote. And importantly, as Margaret pointed out earlier today, some individuals who menstruate do not identify as women, but as men or non-binary. So what does the law have to say about this? Not much. There are very few legal constraints on this big data ecosystem. In the United States, we do not have a comprehensive data privacy law. Instead, our law is very fragmented and only covers certain sectors. For instance, HIPAA, we've all signed those HIPAA forms when we go to the doctor's office, right? It does protect the data that you give your doctors, but it doesn't cover information gathered by mobile apps at all. So instead of law in this space, our system relies on the concept of notice and consent or self-regulation. Right. And this is when you log into a new app or a new website, that little box that pops up where you certify you read the privacy policy and agree to it. OK, uh, privacy policies are quite complicated. This is the policy that I downloaded in connection with the Glow app, a period tracker. It's 28 pages. OK, um, and if you are someone who reads it before you check the box, you are quite unusual. Studies show most people do not. How could you? There's not enough hours in the day. A very prominent study showed that it would take a person 25 days to read all the privacy policies that they see in a year. So law right now is not a bulwark against menstrual surveillance. And so the dynamics that I'm describing run counter to the idea of menstrual justice. And here's an excellent definition of menstrual justice that uh, Margaret Johnson has put forward. And as a result, I contend that the menstrual justice movement needs to expand to recognize and advocate against these forms of data facilitated oppression. And in doing so, this movement can look to data feminism, which focuses on analyzing and combating the ways in which data reinforce structural power inequalities. The reality is that elite white men and the institutions that they control drive the politics and the goals of the data extraction economy. In using these apps, menstruators are providing invisible labor for profit by others. We're seeing increased activism and resistance to oppressive data regimes. One example that I like to highlight is the data, the feminist data manifest no, which lists 30 different forms of resistance to data usage. And I could only put three on the screen, but they're all um, very important and very interesting. As they state, this is a declaration of refusal and commitment. It refuses harmful data regimes and commits to new data futures. So what would femtech look like if it was a tool for menstrual justice rather than a surveillance tool? To begin with, it would be taken out of for-profit industry. It would ban the sharing of information with for-profit third parties. And it would be based on the tenets of design justice, centering the voices of menstruators. It would also involve medical professionals so that these tools are grounded in sound research and clinical practice. Femtech would provide accurate and non-stereotyped educational information about reproductive health. 
It would be honest with users about the appropriate uses and limitations of these tools. Developers would test their algorithms before they're deployed and regularly audit them to make sure the tools are accurate and non-discriminatory. There would be limits on the types and range of data collected, as well as time limits in terms of how long personal data can be retained. And there would also be rights for users to demand erasure of their personal data at any time. So to summarize, we should have tech that works for us rather than profit from us. Thank you, and I look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you, Michelle. Um, we do have some questions, but I'm going to start with a question of my own, or comment, and then I'm going to turn to a question from uh, one of our panelists, actually, Chris Kutopia. But my comment is I'm really struck by the fact that Marcy and Marnie, your papers and presentations are talking about the fact that we have structures, cities, and workplaces that have not envisioned or or thought about being constructed around people who menstruate. And so we're bumping our heads up against brick walls because we don't have adequate toilets and sanitation facilities because it hasn't been thought about or workplaces that accommodate or have breaks or other things that would work well for menstruators. On the other hand, Michelle is talking about an entire industry that is focused on menstruation. It was constructed around it. It also is harming menstruators. So my comment there is I'm struggling with wondering what the answer is here, how we have both attention to that causes harm and lack of attention to that causes harm. And that's just something at some point I'd like to discuss with you all. But let me go to a more specific question from Chris Katropia, who wants to hear from the panelists your thoughts on the implications of labeling or defining menstruation as a medical condition or a medical event where it could be helpful for various legal theories. It could also maybe reinforce stigma and misconceptions. Um, and so let me start with you, Marcy. Any thoughts on that question? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Chris just explicitly identified one of the problems, right, with employment protections in these spaces, right? Because if you label menstruation as a serious health condition or as, a, you know, um, something that could be, a, uh, that you need to seek medical care for, right, on a continuing basis, which for, for many people menstruation is, but right, you might get protection. If you consider um, menstruation a disability, you do get protection if you work for a covered employer. and. Yet I still have a problem with that, right? Um, and so as a litigator, great. If I can get a client protections, right? I'm gonna to talk to them about what it means and, and why, right? There might be some problems, but I'm gonna use any tool that exists right now to help them, whether it's the ADA, whether it's the FMLA, whether it's a provision of a collective bargaining agreement, whether, you know, whatever it might be. But from a sort of theoretical perspective, I don't want menstruation to be considered solely right, um, uh, a, a medical problem that needs to be addressed. So, but um, if you can figure you. out what to do with that and help me work <laughs> through it, I'd really, really appreciate it. And the truth is there are different experiences, right? So it's also hard to, to lump it all together, right? Um, I am not a black woman, but I had fibroids, right? And I have the privilege of being able to control my schedule and go to doctors when I don't have to be at work, where I didn't even have to disclose to people that I was trying to figure out why I couldn't stop bleeding for years, right? Because I didn't have the education, right? Which should be in every school, which you'll talk about next, right? Um, about, I didn't know what fibroids were, right? Despite how common they were. And I was grateful to find the Black Mama's blog, right? Who educated me, uh, or that educated me. And, and it shouldn't, it shouldn't just be me though that can address fibroids at work and can take the time that's needed for, for medical appointments or for, for surgeries and, and um, everyone needs to be able to have the, the sort of just provisions to be able to address their body. And you know, when I was experiencing fibroids, my period was different than it is now. And the workplace thank needs you. to address that, so thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I have another question that I'm gonna ask both Marnie and Michelle if you could address this. Um, is there a place 
for these apps and the citizen science in femtech in a way that it could aid public health research, and that's why I'm including you, Bernie, in this question through self-reporting, but doesn't include the sort of capitalist profit um, motive of the third party to um, gather it. And so is there some value in these apps and can we manage the value while diminishing the, the, bad, the bad parts of it? And maybe I'll ask Marnie first and then Michelle. Um, so I'm going to, I, I can respond. It's a great question. I'm going to defer immensely to Michelle on this because I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about the apps. What I can say is that I certainly have colleagues in public health and medicine who do research with the apps. It's, you know, as we've heard, it's valuable data. Um, and they are fine with that. I have a friend, one colleague at, at Mailman using it in a cancer study because it's sort of breast cancer and early menarche, there may be links between when you get your period and sort of later onset of cancer. So I think they're tremendously valuable potential. Um, but I don't know, and I'll let Michelle respond to this. And I, really some of my colleagues in public health may have good answers for this. Um, how you manage the control of that data. You know, we were exploring doing an app a few years ago and discovered how very expensive they are to, just to develop and to keep up and to do well. And NIH, I think, helps to fund. Like, I have colleagues at Columbia doing an endometriosis app that, you know, is, is very, they're trying to help women. You know, they're trying to help them track mm -hmm. their symptoms. They're for sure using that data uh, to learn about what can we do better? How do we, you know, endometriosis is so difficult to diagnose and is so under attention you know, um, but I, I, you know, I don't know how you manage, I, I would imagine there's a way, but it's who owns that app and how do you promote it? And you run into this issue where the private sector is just much better at marketing their, um, what they're doing than others. So I, I'm curious to hear what Michelle says, because certainly there's a lot to learn. I mean, there's, there's no way we can get that kind of data in other ways. Um, so. Right. Thank you, Martin. Michelle. These are the single biggest data troves on women's health that I think exist in the world right now. So yes, they can absolutely be valuable for medical research and they can be valuable to users. I mean, millions of people download them because they do find it helpful to track their fertility and better understand how their bodies work. So I don't wanna diminish the potential that these tools have, but most people are using them without understanding the the dangers. That's the problem. And when it comes to medical research, um, several of the apps, you know, very proudly partner with and participate in turning over their data for medical research. And there have been some positive outcomes from that. But again, we need to make sure that the users understand how their data is going to be used, that they consent to it. We know there are instances where people don't actually enter accurate data into the apps because they know they're being tracked and they're trying to foil it. So then that potentially undermines the research that's being done. <laughs> so it needs to be a much more transparent system with much more data security um, because when apps say that they're de-identifying your personal information, that's really not true. <laughs> uh, personal information, it's very easy to re-identify it. So there, there is a way to do it right, but there needs to be more of a commitment to do it. Okay. Thank you. I wish we had more time. This is so fascinating. Thank you all for your amazing work and presentations. Uh, let's give a round of applause to our presenters. And we will take a five minute break and come back for our third and final panel, focus on menstrual justice in school. Please come back at 547. I'll call you back then. Okay, let's come back. And I am excited for this third panel. We are so fortunate to have four amazing panelists. This panel is focused on menstrual justice in schools. We have four panelists, as I mentioned, the first will be Diana Phillip. She is the phenomenal, amazing, executive director of NARAL Pro-Choice Maryland. And she'll be speaking on menstrual equity as reproductive justice. Our second panelist is Christopher Katropia, professor He's the Dennis I. Belcher, Professor of Law, Director of Intellectual Property Institute, University of Richmond School of Law. We are so thankful that he 
also does work in the menstrual space. Amazing work that I rely on often. Period poverty and school attendance and performance is his presentation. Then we have Alana Glover, who, special shout out to Alana. She is a recent graduate of our law school, but she was the symposium editor for this conference, which was supposed to happen last year when she was still in law school. Um, and we are so delighted to welcome you back, Alana. She will be speaking on menstrual equity and UB law. She is currently a law clerk for the Court of Special Appeals here in Maryland and has a special position with Ms. JD. So proud of you, Alana. So nice to see you. Mwah. And then our next speaker after that will be also the amazing Laura Strasfeld. Uh, she is a co-founder of Period Equity. We are so delighted she is here. She will be speaking on menstrual equity, comprehensive sex education, and Title IX. So Diana, please turn it over to you. Thank you, Professor Johnson. I really appreciate it. Hi, Diana Phillip. I'm the Executive Director for NARAL Pro-Choice Maryland. I am the head lobbyist for our organization. We are the policy and political arm of the reproductive rights movement in our state. So we're dedicated to ensuring that every childbearing individual has the right to choose if, when, and how they form their families. And when they do decide to parent to do so in dignity, in good health, and in safety. So part of the work that we do is looking at the sexual reproductive health rights of young people. And menstrual equity is something that we definitely have been exploring for the last few years. I've had this job for, now it's my seventh year, and I've been through seven Maryland General Assembly sessions as a lobbyist. And so I want to take you on a little tour, hopefully I can share my screen, of the legislation that has been passed or introduced in the Maryland General Assembly so you have a good idea about policy-wise and legislatively-wise what people have been trying to achieve. Good? All right. Yes. Excellent, thank you. All right, legislation, Maryland General Assembly, menstrual equity, here we go. Let's see if I can get my, there we go. Yep, first one, sorry. So back in 2017, I'm sitting in a committee hearing on the Senate side, Senate finance, and I'm listening to this bill for the first time. It was Delegate Arona Miller, and she presented this bill about the idea that homeless shelters should be providing free supplies of tampons and sanitary napkins to the residents. And someone along the way had also decided that it needed to be amended to include public schools. So in the Senate Finance that time, it's 11 members, nine were men, two were women. And here's Aruna who has no Senate cross file, which if you know anything about Maryland General Assembly work, if you don't have a cross-file bill, meaning somebody in the Senate side that has filed your bill, um, that means there really isn't a senator that's willing to or is available to quite readily champion your bill on the Senate side. So Delegate Miller is sitting there committee hearing and she's starting to describe to the chair, Senator Mac Middleton, all the things that women and girls do when they don't have pads or tampons and rolled up socks and rags and all the things they go through and Mac, Mac Middleton stopped her and said, I think I've had enough. I think I completely understand. And it was one of the few times I've ever seen the Maryland General Assembly that after the hearings were over that day, they voted on the bill and got out of committee in the same day. So this bill, however, was something that a lot of people still don't talk about because they don't understand that it actually got passed. It got kind of passed quietly. There was not really an implementation plan it's the idea that these um, the shelters can provide these free products and also for the county boards of education to have the school nurses, to have them available to students who qualify as homeless under the federal McKinney-Vento Act. And so the deal was that people didn't understand that there was funding. They actually put $268,000 aside for the next five years. So 2017 through 2021, actually 2022, now I think about it. And I, we had one of our interns in 2019 contact the state to see if anybody ever asked for the money for the grants to give to 
the school districts to give to their school nurses and also to um, anybody who's in the Department of Housing and Community Development, any of the nonprofits that they contract out, if anybody asked for that money, the answer was no, because nobody took any time to figure out how to implement this. And it's a real shame, but this is the first bill that was passed into law and it tried to encourage menstrual equ equity. And if you know anything about schools, in the state of Maryland, not every school has a school nurse. There are school nurses that are shared within a school district. So it's not every day that you've got somebody there. It's kind of unfair to say to a student, you know, first off, only for people who are experiencing housing instability. And secondly, you need to go to the school nurse as if you're having an illness that you have to go to the school nurse. And this is the only place where the products are and chances are high, the door is locked because the school nurse is not there. So that was my first um, idea that maybe this is an issue we should take on because if you know anything about, and certainly we've been talking about the public health effects of not having adequate products in order to take care of your body when you're menstruating. So the next bill was the one that Kim Haven talked about. And that is a bill that we had um, had a lobbyist come in and provide the kinds of legislative advocacy needed to pass into law. And this is the first time we tried this bill. I was really surprised that we got it through. I think we joined maybe a dozen other states that had this, the idea that incarcerated spaces, they need to provide supplies at all times at admission by routine basis and by request. And so there's the idea of re uh, requiring standards for the proper disposal to maintain the records. And the idea that when the correctional standards people come during their regular inspections, they're supposed to review the policy records, which is supposed to be maintaining the records on how they provided and the availability. Now the implementation challenges on this, of course, is like Kim pointed out, no idea what the policies are in any of these facilities. And we don't know how well people are actually abiding by them. The other issues are the quality of the products, right? And the absorption, the adhesiveness of the pads. The absorbability is incredibly important because we know that if you give somebody six to eight pads and they're really flimsy, that's not gonna help anybody. And so we kept that all in mind about other menstrual equity bills that could possibly be passed in the state of Maryland. The other, um, well, the implementation challenges Kim went through, so I'm not gonna go through that, but I'm very happy in the first try that we we're able to pass this law. And then we have this one that just passed this past session and this took three years to do. It was introduced in 2019 by Delegate Krill Resnick. And I remember watching him present this bill in House Ways and Means, but he didn't have any advocates with them. And Resnick really felt that this was really a common sense thing for him to do. So I was really surprised. And Ways and Means was the first time they ever heard the bill. And they um, were kind of pushing back and they said, we don't understand after school nurses and why should we do this? And what does this have to do with educational equity? You know, and Resnick did a really good job, but afterwards I went up to him and I said, do you need any help with this bill? And he's like, no, 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 I got it. And, but the bill failed. And the other thing is that he did not have a Senate sponsor as well. So there wasn't anybody on the Senate side to try to champion the bill. In 2020, actually right before it, in the fall of 2019, when we looked at the 2017 bill to see if it was implemented well and found that it wasn't, we went to Resnick's office and said, would you like some help? He said, yeah. So we put together this great alliance of groups, including the University of Baltimore School of Law and Professor Margaret Johnson and her students. And they wrote this really great bill about, you know, I'm sorry, article about Title IX and menstrual equity and had different types of students who testified in favor of this bill. We had, I think, eight public school students that did so from junior high to high school. I wanna say there's about 30 of us that were in the room, ways and means, talking about why this was so important. And we did work with Delegate Resnick about fine tuning the bill, how it had to be size appropriate um, pads because the body of an eight-year-old is gonna be very different than one who's 18 years old. And we wanted to make sure elementary schools were in it. We want to make sure that gender neutral restrooms were in it and male designated restrooms. We talked about waste receptacles. We talked about the problems with clean water, which is a huge problem in the state of Maryland and our public schools. And you know, what do we need to actually do this? But the biggest thing was the fiscal note. And that almost killed the bill in 2020. So the school districts were pushing back because we were in the middle of this huge education reform bill in the state of Maryland. Um, the Maryland um, blueprint for Maryland's future. So the school districts felt like they were getting beaten up on and they're like, oh, what do you mean we need to do this? This doesn't make any sense in trying to make the argument about how 
of access to menstrual hygiene products in the school restroom is the same thing as toilet paper and paper towels and hand soap. And people scoffed at that and said, you know, we, we really can't, some of us can't afford the paper towels and the hand soap, so Diana, you know, and our water isn't clean, so we don't know what you're thinking. But meeting these school teachers who are saying things like, yeah, we, we use our personal, you know, our personal uh, money to go and purchase things and put together little baggies of panties and pads and hand wipes and anything we can do because a lot of these the students, elementary and middle school especially, were unprepared for their periods. And that's, of course, that's the time when people are, are starting their periods. Now we see it's 30 to 50% of young people before the age of 12 will start menstruating. And they're not prepared. They may come from families that can't afford these products. So in order for them to stay in school or even attend classes, which somebody's going to be talking about later, you know, we need to be able to have these products on hand. So in 2020, we passed the bill, but there was no Senate sponsor and we adjourned 19 days early because of the pandemic. Now, had we had a Senate sponsor, they would have heard that bill because I remember they called the bill in the committee and said, hey, does anybody know anything about this bill? And it was like, no, they are like, okay. And they put it away and it, that was it. So this was the year to pass the bill. And this time, Delegate Resnick worked with Senator Sarah Elfrick and Chris West. And why this is so important is because this being a school bill, uh, we had to deal with the fiscal note. And it's really quite interesting how people kept assuming that the, if we're gonna install dispensers in each of the restrooms, that they had to be $400, $600 dispensers in order to have at least one, you know, just one product at a time dispensed because they were concerned that, well, young people, if you give them these products, they're just gonna be juvenile delinquents and they're just gonna throw them down the toilets and stuff up everything. And, you know, we don't need hoarding. We don't need hoarding. You know, we just need to have one, one product dispensed at a time. And they kept saying, well, this is a lot of money. And I kept saying, with a photo from the University of Baltimore School of Law restroom with a $35 high product plastic, dispenser, you know, you can pay 35 bucks, guys. It's one time. Come on. And all you have to do is figure out how to stock the products. And so for this bill, we said it should be a low fiscal note. We kept arguing with the fiscal note. And, uh, you know, it's got to be gender neutral, male designated. And we didn't put in the waste rest receptacles this time. We said at least one restroom in the elementary school, at least two in the middle schools and high schools, by the next year and over the next five years, all female designated restrooms and at least one male designated in all the um, gender neutral restrooms. And still we got the pushback. We got pushback from people saying, no, elementary schools, that costs too much. Gosh, why can't they go to the school nurse? And um, definitely the conservative folks did not want male designated restrooms, did not want gender neutral. So the house side of the bill went through beautifully. Right, because they said this is the same bill that was in position last year. Don't need to amend it. We know what this is all about, but it went on to the Senate side and it got hacked. So they amended out um, the gender neutral male designated in elementary schools. But one of the smart things that did happen is that someone said, if we're going to mandate that there's going to be dispensers in each of them, that um, that should be a capital expense. And as a capital expense, we can make the state pay for that because that was one of the pushbacks is well, who's going to pay for it? But the school districts are going to have to come up with a way for the products to be always in, in the dispensers. And so we got it amended back. We won on elementary schools. We lost on general neutral and male designated. But because we asked for $500,000 to be set aside, that's going to be available in 2023 because it wasn't in time for the budget this year. And so all the school districts by November of 2022 have to develop a plan, send it to the state, so that way they'll reimburse them for any installation that they've done prior to that and any installation in the future. So let's talk about the implementation problems with this bill or challenges that we're gonna have. So we're trying to assure the students who are kind of heartbroken, it's not gonna go into effect this year, it's gonna go into effect next year, but the legislation is the baseline, the schools can do more, right? But there's no measure of accountability. I don't know how many schools of the many schools we have in the state of Maryland. Diana, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt, but time is up. Can you finish oh, up it? in like 30 seconds? Yes, I know you can't see me. I'm so sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. Yes. All right, so yes. And it's the how the dispensers are going to be defined. Are they going to keep the cost low? What are we going to do if the schools are not going to comply? The student activism can, can do the general neutral male designated. The quality of the products, we don't need girls leaving class 
numerous times in a day because the products are so poor. Size appropriateness, the clean water access is an issue. And can we make this a requirement in new school buildings every time a new structure is built? Plenty of opportunities for student activism. Thank you so much. Thank you, Diana, and for your amazing leadership and work on this issue and brilliant about the state financial issue there. Terrific. Uh, next up is Chris Katropia. Um, it's so happy to be a uh, part of this. Um, uh, I, I hope you can hear me and see my uh, screen here. Okay, awesome. Um, yes. uh, so uh, 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 Margaret's right. I'm this kind of oddball where I mainly do intellectual property work. I do a lot of empirical legal studies and now I've started um, apologies to the true public health scholars, Barney. I've decided to say if there's nothing out there, I'm going to do it myself. Um, uh, and uh, so I almost kind of sheepishly come into this. And so what I thought I would do is talk about two things. One is just the current state of the literature, and actually a lot of it's public health literature, um, providing some of the empirical support to the idea of intervening in public schools in the United States or schools in the United States to try to help uh, individuals who menstruate, and then summarize a little bit. Um, uh, Diane did a great job of what's going on in Maryland, and maybe take a little bit of a bigger picture as to what's happening um, at the public school legislation level. Um, uh, so, I, I, I'm when I think about this type of legislation providing menstrual hygiene products in schools, and I'm going to call them MHPs. Um, it is about addressing period poverty, right? This idea that there are individuals who are not able um, to access menstrual hygiene products. And what's kind of interesting, at least to my view about the period poverty here, is it might be an individual who actually can afford them, it's just that they don't have them, right? So they clearly are period poor um, when they're in the moment. Um, and Marnie and, and many others have done a great job of showing that this is a big public health issue outside of the United States. We are so exceptionalist here in the United States. Nothing's going wrong here. Um, uh, that all the literature really before this past last two years focused on middle, lower income co countries. And what has um, unfortunately, but I think is he helpful over the last couple of years is with this legislation being pushed and all of the activism and focus is we're starting to get research in the United States. And hey, guess what? Um, it's as bad here as other places um, and we need to address it. And so um, there's a lot of research out there, a lot, a couple of articles on um, school access issues. And so uh, um, I always hate it when they do at all. So I wanted to show all these fabulous authors names. Um, this is in the Journal of Adolescent Health. Um, and uh, Coleman Key and Billingsley um, got together and surveyed 58 students in St. Louis. Um, high school students, uh, and this won't shock anyone here, a, a, a fairly vast majority of them needed to use uh, menstrual hygiene products at school. Um, so something had occurred at school that needed, they needed to uh, address their menstrual needs. And nearly half of them um, needed a menstrual hygiene product uh, and they didn't have the money to buy them. This is one of the kind of interesting barriers that are out there is that um, they get charged at a lot of schools. Um, uh, and who carries cash anymore anyhow? Um, uh, but if we're thinking about period poverty, this is a problem. And then one of the subsidiary problems that Marnie, et cetera, have researched outside the United States is that there is a fairly decent correlation between um, uh, menstruation management and, and being able to stay in school and become educated. And here they found 17% um, actually missed at least one day of school due to these menstruation issues. Um, another set of individuals, Sakur Turner, Turner and uh, Husef and Oslin, um, did some pilot kind of small intense interviews with high school students in a Midwestern city. Um, and there, the one thing they found was that misrigging products were not available in the school bathrooms, um, only from the school nurses. And I, like uh, Professor Sommer, really like the kind of narrative stories. They're just insanely powerful in this space. And so here's a quote from the article. Um, talking about the fact that they would have to go to the nurse, but also this kind of concern about kind of gatekeepers for menstrual hygiene products. And so um, while school maybe is, or some might think, run like a prison, we have the same kind of gatekeeper issues um, that are coming up that are shown in this survey. Um, uh, and it's not only a gatekeeper to administration, it's a gatekeepers to bathrooms. And I know that Diana, I know has talked about this issue and others, right? It's like, even if you can get them in the bathrooms, uh, guess what? You can't really go to the bathroom. Um, and so this uh, uh, quote really kind of rang true to me 
Um, the fact that we have someone, and this happens a lot, particularly those who are just starting to menstruate, really, really heavy bleeding, needs to do a lot of changes. The problem is, is that you only get a certain number of passes to go to the bathroom. And, and the other thing is that educators tie passes to grades. And so here in, in her school, um, she would get extra credit if she had extra passes. So this is this real kind of juxtaposition between education and access to menstrual management. Um, and finally, this I think is maybe one of the reasons I'm, I'm here. Um, I, this is my what the hell, let's do it. Nobody else wants to do it. Um, and so I surveyed a lot of uh, recent high school graduates. Um, and it turns out a lot of them, again, not shockingly, needed menstrual hygiene products in schools. Um, and, and, a, and a less than half actually even attended a school where menstrual hygiene products were provided at all. Um, and the majority of the provision was with school nurses and through pay. Um, and my uh, survey asked a lot about uh, the interrelationship between education and attendance and access to menstrual hygiene products. And um, two of the kind of big areas were people being late to school because they were having menstrual hygiene management issues that they had to address at home. And one of the biggest issues are individuals having to leave early, right? So, so an accident happens, they can't manage it well. Um, and I think this is where stigma really comes in dramatically. And the easy thing is to plead sickness and I'm going home, uh, which is a problem, right? Um, over 24% of them left early. Um, and then a lot of them said that this kind of, kind of management issues was negatively impacting their um, ability um, to learn. So, so the um, at least correlative evidence that seems to be supporting the anecdotal kind of part of this. Um, uh, and uh, uh, turns out uh, there was a recent study not dealing with with uh, kind of secondary school, but, but university students, um, they experience period poverty too. Uh, this is something that's come in general. They, they, they actually have food scarcity issues that we don't think about. And I think COVID has really experienced, has kind of exposed this. Um, and here, unfortunately, uh, there's a high linkage between the lack of access to products and depression, right? So the, the, kind of the, the stigma really kind of piles on in, in that sense. So we do need um, access. Um, but what, and again, this is someone coming to this with a little bit less knowledge in the space, the lack of even any knowledge um, uh, of this, and I was beneficial enough to grow up in a household with two sisters and a mom that just told it all to everybody. Um, so I was educated about this, um, but unfortunately, it looks like uh, uh, the kids are not. And a hat tip, I always hate doing somebody else's uh, scholarship, but Professor Sommer, et cetera, have a really interesting article where they're interviewing kind of inner city girls um, and the lack of education about menstruation management. And here's, a, I think, a, a great quote. I was in fifth grade. I started bleeding in the school bathroom. I was 12. Didn't really know what to do, so I used tissue paper. My mom never taught me about how to even use pads. It took me four years, right, um, to get the education in that area. And actually, some of the other research has the same thing. So Sequoia and Turner, who do the really little intimate uh, educational groups, this quote to me, the kind of narrative, my friend didn't know how to use a tampon. She left the plastic thing in, and then when she switched the pad, she didn't understand um, uh, the, the stickiness part of it. She just was, was putting it in that. And I think this is the other part when we think about access. It's not just getting products, but also teaching um, uh, individuals that might not be being taught in other spaces about how to manage um, their menstruation. And then finally, uh, this is kind of a theme throughout. And when I think about kind of Margaret's work, et cetera, I get a lot of chicken and eggy here in a sense of there's the product solution side, but there's the stigma over kind of arching part of this. And I don't know which needs to be addressed first. And uh, this is where I find it difficult. And so the one thing I didn't expect in the survey I did, I had an open question. Uh, this was an online survey. And normally people don't answer these narrative questions. Like, give me my money. I'll check the boxes. 73% um, of the people who responded to the survey provided a narrative um, which really kind of rang true to me that this was an experience that they had. Um, and the narrative went from the more um, kind of root stuff of menstruation is, is dirty and shameful, you don't talk about it, um, to all the other stigmatizations um, that probably, unfortunately, you all have a better sense of than I, right? The idea of if I make aware that I need to manage, then there's the subsidiary factors. Oh, now she's on PMS or she's acting off or moody. Oh, she must be there. Then there's the administrative kind of, uh, kind of barrier part. And just like in the prison setting, um, in the school setting, a lot of administrators are 
male. I don't want to talk to males about my issues. And unfortunately, nurses are seen as gatekeepers as well. Um, and so this is, again, the kind of an undercurrent that seems to be a big part of, of what's going on. Okay. So, um, so what about the legislation? And, and, and this is where, and I, I think I'm still naive on this point, that I think we could do data-based policymaking. <laughs> Can we please do data-based policymaking? Um, uh, so uh, the data is there, and I think that it's more and more getting there. And I think that's why it's great that Professor Sommer and others are doing research in this space. Um, we've had some legislation passed, and Diana Maryland's not on the list. I don't know if the governor has signed it yet or not, and so it was so recent, I didn't kind of put it up there um, or not. Uh, but these were the, the uh, uh, states that had adopted legislation. Georgia is asterisk because Georgia actually doesn't have a requirement for it to be put in schools. They just put it in their budget, so it's a little more temporary. Um, a lot of states are considering this legislation, and I think the biggest thing in this space is how it varies. And I think the biggest conundrum is the unfunded versus funded. So Diana talked about the fact that they have capital funding in Maryland, but not the actual kind of consumption funding. In Virginia, the problem is it's unfunded. Um, some states are targeting based on income because like California, some are just doing it in high school. And then finally, there is this thought of that we can include tampons in this, which is a problem, particularly for um, individuals who are going to get into sports, et cetera. Um, and so I think that the legislation's there, but it's good to think about the specific solutions that are there uh, one way or another. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you for your empirical work on this and for will, being willing to go get data that you identified as missing uh, because it's certainly been beneficial to all of us. I know my students cited your work for their testimony in working with Diana on the Maryland bill. So thank you. And we cited it in our Title IX article. So thank you so much. I look forward to what else you're gonna do with your empirical work. Um, and I love the fact that you are citing to Professor Summer and you know using her as a role model to, to do this work. I just love that. So our next speaker is Alana Glover. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> All right. I just um, want to thank Professor Johnson, of course, the University of Baltimore Law Review for, for including me. I'm just going to discuss a little bit from the student advocate, advocacy perspective, being just not, not even a year ago in many of the students' cho shoes that are listening today. Um, so just talking about really the importance of student advocacy, coalition building, and also talking about equity issues and intersectionality and how the issue of menstruation products and having access to those products affect um, different people, such as Professor Neal talked, African-American women, um, Black women, women of color do um, suffer from different issues such as fibroids, including myself. So this was an issue that was very important to me to sign on to and make sure that um, I participated in advocating to the university. Um, so just a little background and Professor Johnson is very humble, <laughs> but she also played a very important role in um, myself and other students um, submitting a proposal to the University of Baltimore School of Law to ensure that they started providing um, access to free menstrual products throughout the university. Um, so you might be asking why build a coali coalition? So although access to adequate, adequate menstrual products should not be revolutionary change, as we have heard from many of our speakers today, it still is. In order to achieve, achieve transformative change, it is important to build coalitions to gain more influence and momentum behind an initiative than just one individual organization has on its own. So before I go into the proposal um, and kind of what we ask for and how we move forward with that process, I wanna thank um, some of the other students who are not here, but I will share with them as well. Um, Kathleen Goodwin, um, who was a Women's Bar Association president at the time. We had um, Catherine Halliday, who was a student associate for the Center on Applied F Feminism. We had Jennifer Mahan, who was on the e-board of If When How Lawyering for Reproductive Justice. And we also had myself, who was the director of community service for the Black Law Students Association and on the e-board as well. So when we talk about coalition um, building, when we talked about um, reaching out to the university in order to support this initiative, we also reached out to organizations that may not have had, likely had, or you would not think would likely have it um, be impacted by this initiative, but all different groups of communities, regardless of color, um, regardless of socioeconomic status, regardless of what their um, 
views are on different issues all could come together for this one specific issue. So we had student organizations such as the Family Law Association, Outlaw, Parents in Law School, UB Spy, Students Supporting the Women's Law Center, and the Women Bar Association also sign on to this project. We also have faculty, and many of them are on this call today. Um, we had Professor Emerson, Professor Gilman, Professor Havard, um, Jaros, Keys, Lee, McLean, Meadows, Meyerson, Murphy, Neil, Rubison, Trivetti, and um, Professor Welly sign on. And I just wanted to mention all those professors because the reality is when you're coalition building and you're advocating for something such as this, every individual person and group really matters and they make their voice heard in order to accomplish this goal. Um, so being able to advocate from a student perspective and my own experiences, as well as alongside other student organizations and faculty is what helped us push this momentum forward. So in the proposal we submitted to the university, we made sure that it, to emphasize that menstruation is a natural bodily process affecting over half of the population. And we believe that menstrual hygiene products should be regarded as fundamental necessities to the hygiene of our academic and social environment, um, just the same as toilet paper and soap dispensers is. Um, however, um, surprisingly, although half of the population at the University of Baltimore at the time were menstruators, there were no machines on the universe, within the University of Baltimore School of Law that provided menstrual hygiene products. So in the proposal, we made sure that we prioritized that when we were asking for these products, we didn't just want them in the women's bathroom. We wanted them in the women's bathroom, in the men's bathroom, in the non-gender bathroom, so that everybody, regardless of whether they um, identified as transgender, non-binary, or intersex, would be able to have access to these products. So we also made sure to explain how poor access to menstrual products reduced uh, menstruating individuals' productivity and edu educational um, attainment. Um, which is true from my own experiences, as I explained, um, and as Professor Neal mentioned, um, many times women of color may, you know, experience additional issues or any women who has, um, who have experienced fibroids or things like that, which can severely, can severely hinge on your educational experience. Um, imagine being a student and there's nowhere on campus for you to access these products and you're sitting in a three hour class, or, you know, you have to sit through a three hour exam and, and you can't very well leave the university and walk three blocks down the street in order to get these products. Um, and that, that was an issue and that's why we really need to address it. I think that a lot of times um, they don't, a lot of people don't really think about that, but, but, but it really does affect your educational environment You being able to be a successful student um, at school, whether you're at the university level or whether you were in high school. Um, I think D Diana said earlier, and I think our speaker who just spoke was also talking about at the elementary, middle and high school levels. And I know for me, um, when I was in high school, we didn't have access to products. So that, that it was also an issue. If you don't have those products, what do you do? Um, besides go home and then have to leave your educational environment. Um, we also pointed out that one of the closest um, places to obtain these products was three blocks away and of course overpriced. Um, every, every university I attended, whether it be undergrad or law school, any place in the vicinity that has menstrual products hikes up the, <laughs> the price. And I think it kind of goes to what Professor Gilman was said, but in a different context is that there's different companies and organizations, of course, that are looking to make money um, from these situations that they know that of course, menstruators find themselves in. Um, and then we made sure that we emphasize in this proposal that we address potential arguments that of course the university is a public school. So providing free products um, those products would be available to everyone, um, not just specifically students or one specific group. But we pointed out how that would be a positive rather than a negative. Um, the goal of providing these free products was to make sure students, staff, faculty, visitors visiting the school um, would, that are having menstrual flow would not be um, prejudiced or precluded from participating in different events, from being able to feel comfortable in that environment because they did not have access to those products. Um, so, so that's really my presentation. I want to talk, <laughs> talk a little bit just in closing about just really the importance of students participating in transformative change. Like I, I want to thank Deanna and um, Christopher for talking about their studies and how we need to have these products in schools. Um, but students really can be their very 
best own advocates in these situations to talk from experience. And when we presented this proposal alongside Professor Johnson and all of the faculty that really supported us, that's what we emphasize is our experiences. And I think being able to speak on why these are needed is just as important as we have our um, academics and we have our studies, but coming alongside them and supporting that work that they are doing to go to your university or you know, go to your children's school or even teaching um, your children to being able to advocate to their university alongside that is what helped us <laughs> in this process and to be able to accomplish a favorable result. Um, so just, just in this whole process, student advocacy plays a very important role. Um, and I just wanted to come and share how we were able to do that in this instant case and hopefully um, encourage any others who are interested in conducting transformative change or accomplishing um, missions such as this and participating as a student. Um, your voice can still matter in these scenarios as well. So thank you for having me <laughs> and I'll pass it over to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Alana. Um, we are so fortunate to have had you and your colleagues who advocated for this change. And um, I remember well that meeting where you all presented your work to the Dean who was blown away and approved your request. And, and we have those um, dispensers now in our bathroom. Of course, we can't access the building because of COVID, but when we come back, if there are any first year uh, UB law students here, you will in fact see the result of Alana's advocacy. And thank you so much for that. Our next speaker is Laura Strasfeld. And I just, before she speaks, I wanna note the time we've run over a little bit. Laura's gonna speak for her 10 minutes. It's gonna be amazing. And then we are going to have a period for question and answer because we can't let people go without answering some of your questions on this last amazing panel. So Laura, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, and you can hear me okay? Cool. Yes. Uh, let me just um, get it so I can, okay. So, um, I actually don't, I, I tossed my, uh, my, my notes and presentation and um, I was supposed to speak about comprehensive sex ed and Title IX. Um, and I'll tell you why I'm not speaking about that in a minute, but I just, I do really wanna thank you, Margaret and Michelle and, and the organizers of this conference. I really, find the mix of speakers already to be so powerful and important, which is why I tossed my <laughs> notes because I, I feel like I get to wrap up a little bit and hopefully like, you know, in, in less than 10 minutes. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, and you'll, you'll see more of my appreciation in a moment, but um, first of all, for, for people I'm meeting, seeing for the first time, I'm, um, a co-founder of Period Equity, which is right now the only legal organization that's devoted to menstrual equity. And um, I got into this in, in ways that I'm sure is familiar to all of you getting into this yourselves, but I, um, although maybe a lot earlier, because I was a law student years ago in New York at Columbia, and um, I had, you know, exact change and I wanted to buy some tampons and chapstick and, and I went over and I didn't know why. And the clerk told me that I was actually paying tax on the tampons, but not the chapstick and the chapstick had a medical use. Um, so that started what became now um, as of 2016, when I was able to finally file a lawsuit against New York State um, the, and, and form period equity that became, you know, a lot of the work that I'm doing. Um, and I wanted to just make a few observations, I think, from the front lines about this work. Um, there, yes, we have a comprehensive, a CSE comprehensive sex education need, as um, many of you have brought up um, and, you know, starting early and um, meaning in kindergarten, K through 12. And there are plenty of models of this around the 
world. Um, and now we have some great scholarship. Thank you to all of you um, about Title IX and how to go into court with this. Um, I want to shout out to you, Chris, um, that you know we're using your research and other research. Um, we've been citing it in the lawsuit that we filed against Michigan in August um, to challenge its tampon tax as unconstitutional. So period equity now is mainly focused on removing the tampon tax around the country, but my passion um, is about basically the, the three and maybe four main issues that we do. Of course, removing the tampon tax, um, getting free access to products for everyone who needs them, uh, really looking at the safety and sustainability of these products, and then also making sure that um, they're used safely, um, that we, we remove the stigma against menstruation with comprehensive sex ed. So all of these have these legal campaigns um, to, to sort of get them out in the world. So I wanna just give you a little report about that, about what I've been seeing, and then um, close with a plea. <laughs> so first the observations. Um, menstrual equity bills, as many of you have said, are really popular. They've been popular um, since we've been, you know, all of us have been getting them into the news. And that's obviously a good thing because so much of what we're fighting is lack of uh, awareness of these issues. But um, the, um, the problem is in, in most of the country that we are finding people awakening to menstrual equity issues, there are so few lawyers. So um, I think of what you all did, um, Diana and all of you in Maryland as a real model for um, how we can get this work done. Because then again, back to observations that what has happened is that um, the lack of lawyers <laughs> um, has led to some ineffectual and sometimes bad policy. And I'm gonna give some examples of that. And, and that's why Chris, I, I wrote you a message like, can we get a data big, we have to get more organized about this because we need to draft better legislation and we need to include in the legislation implementation and enforcement policies. So examples, New York City in 2016 in the summer was the first uh, legislative body to pass access laws. So beautiful package of laws um, that was you know, really addressing the lack of products in, in prisons and um, you know, um, correctional facilities in New York City and schools and shelters. Um, at that time, the city budgeted $3.4 million for that. 1.7 was supposed to be for the boxes and 1.7 for the products. Um, there's a very savvy entrepreneurial box manufacturer. They, they got the 1.7 million. And according to two close friends of mine who, who are principals in New York City schools, um, that company came in and put up those boxes. Um, they were, you know, vandalized, taken down, you know, but the, the products never went into the schools. And, and please, you know, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but the, this is the general idea is that that money was not spent, it has not been spent since, that there are products in New York City schools, but according to my anecdotal information, that um, principals are buying the products from discretionary funds that they, you know, where they buy other stuff. So um, we, we need enforcement. Um, and there are many ways to do this. And I've talked before about this, and I've talked about using procurement structures in many, um, municipalities um, through the Department of Education that, you know, they buy toilet paper. Um, they can, we can just go through a regulatory route and get them to buy these um, menstrual products. The, it, the benefit of that in some cases, like in New York state, is that there are also clean and green requirements so that um, vendors of menstrual products will have, will have to, um, you know, affirmatively disclose any chemicals of concern 
and we can um, work on procurement regulations to make, um, and, and this is why I like to say that the, all these issues come together, is that the people we care about most um, in getting um, organic cotton products or products that we don't have as great concern with um, are the people who need free products, the people in schools, in, in prisons, and in shelters, because they're already exposed to um, the greatest environmental health concern. So we need to combine all of these and use procurement regulations and structures to get um, good products to, and, um, to people who need them for free. So um, another quick example um, observation of why we need more lawyers involved is that um, there's a labeling, there are these labeling bills and there's a whole story I could tell you, a very quick version is that um, this great organization, Women's Voices for the Earth, they've been doing these um, fantastic and very important um, uh, research and papers about environmental toxins, all sorts of things affecting women's health, including menstrual products. And they initiated a um, menstrual product labeling bill in New York State several years ago that actually passed. The problem is that it was so good that the industry got wind of it and they created a um, an organization that is going after these bills and gutting them. And they did this in um, California this year, um, last year in 2020, California was going to pass a bill like the New York bill that would require labeling down to um, ingredients or additives that we're concerned about. But this industry group came in, they're well-funded and they gutted the bill. And so please no more labeling bills. I was on the calls um, to discuss the New York bill. And because of my background as a plaintiff's attorney, I was already worried that um, a bill like this would be cover for companies to claim if we wanted to sue them that they were uh, abiding by all of the laws, especially this new fancy law that they had, um, so that they were, you know, this was a great defense for them. So I was the only attorney on um, that call with, you know, um, a couple dozen advocates. Okay, so here, and I'm, there's so much more to say about this, but here's my plea that, like I said, um, we need lawyers. I, I'm running period equity actually with no funding right now. Um, I live in New York City. I don't live in Wyoming, but I am speaking to people in Wyoming. Um, I'm speaking to Missouri. I'm speaking to Arkansas because people just see our website and are calling me. But there's no reason if you're in Maryland um, or, or elsewhere, thanks, Margaret, um, I see that my time is up, that, um, that we can't get better organized. And the scholarship is so important. But I do think, again, um, the model that Diana described about Maryland and, and I think getting more organized with the drafting of the legislation is a way that we can um, get this stuff done. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. Um, I hope everyone will take you up on your plea because Laura is a force to be reckoned with and partnering with her will ensure that you can help effectuate change. I have a series of questions. I have one question for each of our panelists and I'm going to state them now and then I'll call on you one at a time uh, and this will then end our program. So for Diana, what's next on the Maryland agenda with these issues? Let me just state all my questions before you talk. I'll come back to you. Um, for Chris, what empirical studies remain to be completed? What other information do we need? For Alana, how can an incoming student prepare or pursue um, which law school is the right fit for them if they want to pursue applied feminism? And how did you decide on which law school to go to? Was it for this program or other reasons? And for Laura, how do you stay connected with activists and lawyers in states all over the country? So if you remembered your question, <laughs> I'm gonna to go to Diana first. Thank you, Margaret. So um, I think in a couple of years, we'll probably come back to the legislature and trying to prove how schools have been inserting the, 
dispensers and gender neutral and male designated restrooms and how the world hasn't exploded and toilets have not exploded, that it's an okay thing and that we should have all the school districts do that will be one thing that we, we're gonna do. And other legislation I just put in the, the chat about uh, we're gonna be seeking a sex education, health education bill next session that will try to increase the number of certified health instructors in order to deliver the lesson plans, not skip over them, not do a really crummy job of delivering them, but have people more confident and hopefully less biased in providing that kind of lesson plans for the new standards that were released last July that all the school districts have five years to come to compliance. The problem is that we don't have enough higher ed schools that have a certification program like Frostburg University in the state of Maryland does. So um, that sex education is gonna be a big part of it. And the other thing for you to know, this last session, there were two other bills that were tried. House Bill 711 gives you up to a thousand dollar tax deduction on donations that include menstrual equity products. And also 757, which failed, which said that Department of Health people, um, employees had to give free menstrual hygiene products to people who are Medicaid recipients and that the uh, community action centers also had to give them to women. But the bill failed probably because people were wondering what about the funding? How are we gonna do that? And how are we gonna keep it up? Okay, excellent. Thank you, Chris. So um, this is where my academic and my advocate hat vary. Um, what, I, what I tried to do initially was a random controlled uh, trial. I tried to convince a, a county to randomly distribute dispensers in one school and not in another school. And let's do this really scientific. Um, uh, they asked me what political party was funding my request. We can talk about all that. I've got some wild stories, but um, I think it would be interesting to at least use the states that have adopted to find out an answer to Laura and Diana's question of, are they actually putting stuff in the schools? I think that's something that just would be nice to get a sense of is how these unfunded mandates are actually kind of playing out. Because one of the things I'm concerned about is that we pass legislation and everybody says, whoop de doo we've solved it, let's move on. And I can just tell you from the Virginia experience, we have not. Um, I've worked with a group and we've been trying to pull schools. And even though it's a mandate, it's an unfunded mandate and it's not being furthered and it's not being replaced. So I, that would might be one that would be interesting. And there's some states where you can get some good public data, Chicago, has some pretty good data on their schools and they've had it in Illinois for a couple of years. And it, it, that, that might be the next place. I know it's just correlative, but it would be interesting to just see um, both from an academic perspective and a um, policy perspective. Thank you, Alana. Yes, I am going to give my bias perspective <laughs> and say if they are looking for a school, I definitely suggest the University of Baltimore School, school of Law for Center for Applied Feminism. I think learning from both Professor Gilman and Professor Johnson, they are so committed um, to the program. They are really committed to making sure the students that participate in the Center for Applied Feminism are coming out to be um, amazing legal scholars that are really pushing forward um, this type of work um, when at the law school and even after law school. Um, so I definitely think UB is the only choice. Um, and I also wanted to add in our advocacy and being able to actually have the school um, give a positive feedback and actually add the products. I think that was very meaningful and telling as well because there are a lot of schools that still don't offer um, those products as they should. And I think one thing that I was gonna say as a menstruator, a young woman that was in the law school, a lot of times we didn't really feel welcome in the building. Um, we didn't, a lot of the you know, head administrators, I think um, like Chris had said, a lot of, you know, in, in schools and stuff, they're not thinking about those things. It's almost like um, we are an afterthought. And I think us being able to advocate for that and then them actually making the change made us feel like we were seen and welcome in this environment. And that's important, especially I would say at a law school where you're spending 10 hours a day, sometimes eight hours a day, you know? So I am giving my full bias opinion. I think University of Baltimore Center for Applied Feminism is the best way to go. And I had one out, one one out actually message me um, during this event and just talk about how beneficial it will be for her um, to have those products. So I just wanted to talk about, you know, how this has really transformed the um, learning environment, hopefully after COVID, um, where people can come in that building um, regardless 
of whatever they identify of, regardless of their um, menstruation or any of their additional health issues they may have, similar to my case, and they can feel welcome there. Um, and they can feel like that's an environment where they're allowed to learn and be successful. Thank you, Alana. Love your bias, of course. And Laura. Um, you asked me how I stay connected to advocates. Yep, and um, lawyers across the country. Advocates across the country and a shout out to Alana because it's, there is um, the students, I mean, you're amazing. I had some amazing Fordham Law students help me create a database. So if anybody needs to know of any advocates in any state, um, just um, email me at Laura at Period Equity and I can tell you, but it's pretty easy um, to find out who's working on these issues if you if you want to, but I had so much help from law students over the past couple of years. It's, um, it's made it a lot easier. Well, thank you so much. And I wanna thank, and let's all thank this amazing panel for enlightening us and bringing their research and work and advocacy uh, to us. And speaking of students, Laura, it's like we share a mind. I need to thank the amazing Law Review students. You may have noticed in the chat, they are researching and finding links to everything our presenters have ever spoken or written. I'm blown away by you. Thank you, Law Review students, for doing this work. We'll hear more from them at the beginning of the conference tomorrow morning. Um, and also thanks to the student associates for the Center on Applied Feminism. They've been tweeting and tagging our presenters. And I hope you all will retweet. I forgot to say at the beginning that we have a hashtag menstrual justice and a hashtag feminism privacy. So you can follow the thread from today. Thank you all for coming and being a part of this. I really loved having the Zoom room rather than the webinar so that we could see each other um, and hear from each other and sort of chat back and forth. Tomorrow, we start again at 9 a.m. Our Dean will do the first welcome. Um, I'll do another welcome and we will hear from our law review, uh, the successors to Alana, the editor in chief and the symposium editor. Uh, we are so thrilled that we get to co-sponsor this conference every year with them where they publish some of the papers that will be presented tomorrow. So we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. If you can make it, thank you all for coming today. And um, just thank you. Michelle, any further remarks? See you tomorrow, bright and early. Come for as much or little as you can. We'd love to have you for any portion of your day you can share with us. All right, thank you so much. <laughs>